presentation. Um, we have Dr. Tamara Sacco here. Um, read a little bit of background. She's an attorney mediator in Utah. She has a private law practice that she's been running since 1998, focusing on family law. She graduated with honors from BYU Law School, and she also has a PhD in marriage, family, and human development. She works under Alan Hawkins. Um, she's also participated in conflict resolution course through Pepperine. Um, Tamara taught mediation as a law professor for 14 years, and she received the Phi Alpha Delta Professor of the Year Award in 2006. That's the best that, part. That's speaking. good. That's good. <laughs> and, and she has a private mediation practice focusing on a divorce and domestic mediation since '97. So we're going to turn the time over to her. There are some handouts. Did everybody get one? Okay. If we run out, I'll make more copies. But we'll turn the time over to her. Okay. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. As it said, I taught I taught at BYU for 14 years. They have upgraded the system since I taught last. So that's exciting. Um, I also speak at Education Week, so that's when I get to come to the campus probably the most. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my story. So I am a divorce attorney. I divorce people about five divorces a week. I do. I do about 230 divorces per year. So I divorce a lot of people. And so what I know the best is what makes marriage not work. That's my specialty. If you want to teach your clients how to make their marriage horrible, I am your girl. <laughs> I can tell you what all the things they can do to make their, their marriages horrible. So when you get into divorce work, the reason that I have stayed inside the profession is because I have a big commitment to children. Like, I have six kids of my own, and one of my daughters is here. This is Serena, my only daughter, by the way. So that means there's five other boys. So you can imagine how my house is like. Um, so, and, um, I'm, so I'm really, really committed to kids and helping peace inside families. However, that needs to be facilitated. So sometimes in mediation, I'll tell the, the people, you know, I care more about your kids than I care about you. And most people will say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And it's a very interesting shift from marriage into divorce. Because when you shift into divorce, a lot of times the common ground, if people have kids, that is the common ground, the kids. In other words, I can act better in behalf of the kids. And the saddest part from my perspective as a, as a practitioner is the fact that a lot of the cases that I see in divorces could have been prevented through some things that we're going to talk about today. And, and so that's the saddest part from my perspective. A lot, and you guys are, have, are going to have therapy majors, and some of you are therapists, social workers. We work with each other a lot. I got my, I got my PhD in marriage, family, human development after working 10 years inside the profession. The reason why is I was like, if I don't start doing some prevention and preventative work, I'm gonna burn out of this profession. It's too hard, there's too much conflict, there's too much hate, there's too much sorrow, there is too much negativity, and for you, I've been mediating for 20 years now, and I've done thousands and thousands of cases. I want to stay committed to the profession, but I care a lot about the family unit, and so I thought, you know what I can do? I can speak. So I'm speaking today, I, I take on about 10 speaking commitments a year, and I speak all over. Um, this week, on Thursday, I'm, I'm traveling to Canada, and I'm speaking five times in Canada. All throughout, I, I talk about all things um, in family and relationships and communication and negotiation. So, so I am I'm really, really committed to healthy families. Like, I am the embodiment of like healthy family. I want people to have healthy conflict resolution, healthy communication. So that's why I spent four years getting my PhD in the middle of my profession, so that I could do some more preventative work. And so I have this big crazy goal to help 100,000 marriages, not divorce, by the way, on the preventative side. So this is my big crazy goal. So if, if the presentation that I give today helps your marriage or people you're working with in any way, I encourage you to go to my website, which is on the bottom footer, mindfulmarriage.love, and put in a story, a, a good marriage story. I think 
when you look at Facebook, a lot of times you see explosions of families, don't you? Because you cannot hide a divorce. Can a divorce be hidden? No. No, it's a very public affair. For that reason, it gets publicized, and the, and the horror of, of the family story gets spilled out over time and ripples. We, we see less on social media about, we have the most amazing marriage, and we're doing these things. We hear less about that. And so I encourage people to be ambassadors for good marriages. So people uh, often, I probably get a phone call maybe twice a month saying, hey, I've got this friend, and they're thinking about divorcing, can they call you? And I always give my same speech, so I'm gonna give you my speech that I get. So if I catch someone that early where they haven't yet divorced, so I think of divorce like a snowball fight. We're in Utah, so that's appropriate. Have you all been in a snowball fight yet? I know we have students that weren't like here, here, Utahns. So in a snowball fight, you can throw the first snowball, but once you throw the first snowball, guess what? The fight has begun. And it's very difficult to stop, stop the snowball fight after you've thrown one snowball. So I tell people, have a mindful marriage. That's my, that's, my, that's my gig that I do, mindful marriage. And don't just tell someone, don't threaten him, I'm going to divorce you. Like, it's got to be a system that you're really thinking through. Because you can throw the first snowball, but you can't stop the fight. Once a, a spouse, let's just say a wife, says, I'm going to divorce and then tells her people. Do you know who her people are? Her mama, and watch out for the daddy, because they come to mediation sometimes. And her best friends, and her sisters, and her aunts, and her uncles. So once you get the village involved in the divorce process, or thinking about divorce, it's very difficult to repair the marriage. You guys probably know that as, as therapists. So the smaller that they can keep, so I tell people that are having problems, work it out with the Lord, Work it out with yourself, work it out with your spouse, or use third-party professionals to get it worked out. You know, but when you start using your best friends and your sisters, almost everybody who divorces has are on someone's shoulders. That's what I've learned as a divorce practitioner. What that means is there is a sister, a best friend, a mother, a father, someone actively supporting them in the divorce. And that's for the person that's filing. Usually, the person not filing doesn't have that same phenomenon. So who files divorces? Husbands or wives? What do you think? <laughs> That's a loaded question, right? I'll answer it for you. It's wives. It's wives. Two-thirds of all divorces are filed by women. Women in the research are called the relationship keepers. And so... Uh, only a third of the divorce are from men, two-thirds from, from women. So um, it's, it's really important. So when people call me, I say, fight for your marriage. I say, try everything possible to save it. I say, move if you need to. Get rid of your computer. Move over to a flip phone. Like, whatever, you know what I think? I go wide and big. Get help for your addictions. Like, all of these things. Do everything. And the reason why is I want people that I love to be able to look their kids in the eye one day and say, I tried everything possible to save this marriage. And more important than that, I want them to be able to look God in the day, God in the eyes, and say, you know, Lord, that I tried everything because we know, and I'm at BYU so I can speak freely, which is kind of fun, um, but we know that the family is the fundamental unit of the celestial kingdom, really, right? It's, it's the family. So when, so if there's one decision that you make on this earth that can affect your eternities, do you know what it is? Divorcing. Do you see what a big ripple that has, not just here, but there? Both spaces. And so I tell people to really, really fight for their marriage. So I'm going to tell you, this is my passion project, by the way. So all my prevention is my passion project. So this is how I'm trying to influence 100,000 marriages. And I hope a few of you will get onto the website and so I can count, count your click. Um, so I have a Mindful Marriage Facebook page. I have a Mindful Marriage Instagram page. We, we post there three times a week something about good marriages or resilience inside of marriage. I have a Mindful Marriage YouTube. I have a website, Mindful Marriage. And here's a really cool thing that I do. So I... Um, 
I have an education program that I do, and every Thursday a new video gets released. And the videos are 15 to 30 minutes long, they're little segments, and they have um, worksheets and things for couples to do. It's just so that couples can have an opportunity to talk about topics inside of marriage and do some things together because people communicating about marriage is really, really important. And people were telling me, Tamara, we just don't, like, what, what am I going to do? Who, who likes to talk about their marriage the most? Men or women? Mm-hmm. Women, right? But it's not like you can just sit down and say, hey, husband, talk to me about marriage. Okay, what? Like, so this is it's a lot of activities. It's a lot of guidance, a lot of things to help connect couples. It's $10 a month. People can cancel at any time. It's just, and every Thursday, a new video comes out. I'm just finishing the Mercies course, which... I won't, go, I won't go into it, but I'm just finishing the Mercies course, and then I'm starting a foundational course um, in August on, on the website. So that's fun. They can, they can go in and download and do whatever they want and, and talk about things. I have, um, so last education week, someone said to me, hey, you don't have any books out. And it's true. So I wrote a book with Deseret Book a long time ago. And then I wrote a couple books with Alan Hawkins in PhD school. And then I have like 50 other books on my computer. Like they're just right there. And so I I have this that I've written in the last, and since education week, which was last August, I want, like I've tried guys. I wrote this book, which is really fun. This is um, a mindful marriage journal. It's letting couples write their own stories, really. And so inside of these journals, um, it has conflict resolution processes, it has soothing processes, it has um, 200 date ideas, romance ideas, it has 365 love map, like, hey, what what are you feeling about these different things to facilitate discussions. It has harbor sections to, and date journals. It has everything that, it has quarterly retreats, it has everything that's needed to help people write their own love story. Does that make sense? Like, you need questions to write your own love story. So that's what this book is. And then I had my niece get married this year, and she was trying to prep out for her marriage, and she had this book that wasn't working well. She's like, Auntie, you've got to write a new book. So I wrote a new book for her, and I'm happy to say it just came out on Friday. I'm sad to say that she got married two months ago. <laughs> But I, this is still for Danielle in bed. So this is 365 questions to ask before and after marriage. Love map is one of the foundational principles that John Gottman talks about to help couples connect. A love map is knowing your partner's dreams, hopes, their fears, their good, their bad, their preferences, what they like at McDonald's, or if they like McDonald's or at all, if they want mayonnaise or extra mayonnaise or pickles. You know, so the, this helps build love maps. I suggest that parties go through this every two years to update love map. This goes through everything that a person would want to know, probably plus a little bit. So there's some sections I say, you don't have to talk about this, this if you don't want to, because we go into like past histories of addictions and things like that. I mean, everything that you can imagine. So this one, um, this, the main sections in this book are um, the romance titles, dating and recreation, holidays, traditions, vacations, appreciation, service, communication, conflict resolution, dedicated time and work patterns, gifts, religion, fidelity, friendships, the past, finances, schooling, social friends, medical, study goals, affection, intimacy. And so this one is fun because you know what people need is dialogue. They need questions. So this is another book that people are writing on their own. So those are some things that I'm super excited about. And as we get in our presentation today, here, so I've done six books so far since August. And I've got another 30 to go. Um, These are all just my passion projects. But this series right here is the Character Education Hero series that I've written for kids and families. So the cool thing about this part, even in marriage, is it helps create a family dialogue. So um, this is the book that just came out on Friday. I haven't even released it online yet. I'm releasing it this week, so I'm really excited about it. This is the bullying book that I wrote. Um, So the first three books talk about the six different styles of communication and how, and these are the biggest bridges to gap and how they differ and where the conflict comes. It's written in a child story form and um, inside of it, the books have, and I chose my own illustrator and I think she's amazing. It's really fun. So each page has a hunt 
where the child looks for the symbol on this page. And here's the story, and then here's the adult explanation or teaching about it, teaching about the conflict resolution. This book, the feedback that I've got in the book so far, like one mom told me, like, I learned more than my kid did. It's like, right, this is really to teach foundational skills to families, if that makes sense. And so it goes over the six different styles of communication that we're going to talk about today. And I, I do each style with a different animal. And so there's six styles, six animals, and then inside the book, you can see how each animal works with every other animal. Now, unlike personalities, the whole thing about marital mediation, and um, it's a different technique because we don't, my um, frame of reference doesn't come from like a personality. It comes from a communication style that can be adapted. Does that make sense? So I, I don't have a belief like you are blue or yellow or you're a driver or, you know, like that's not how this works. What it works is you have some natural skills and styles, but, but that each person can be educated and through education can do all six styles at the appropriate time. So in this bully book, he's a turtle and a turtle is an avoider, someone that is timid and shy and, and fearful and afraid to, to engage. And so through this book, he's taught how to use every other style. So he learns how to be a demanding lion, a convincing fox, and negotiating. And in it, it shows every technique. So he gets communication dragon status, which means, hey, even though I'm not those, I use a technique from each. So the point is for you, and then once his style is working again, we teach people, you can use your natural style if it's working. Right? But at the point that it's not working, that's where you have to go in and utilize. And then the back of these books have teaching plans and questions and things to ask kids to help them. And so far, the feedback that I'm getting on this series, and it's pretty new, as you guys know, but that kids are really loving it and going back and back to the book um, over time. And part of that is because of the search. You know, like when they're bored, like they'll go back to the search items and things like that. But also some parents have told me that there's been circumstances that are kind of similar to the book, and they're like, Mom, that's like, you know, Tiffany the Turtle in this book, in the camping book, you know? And so that's what's really exciting about that. I've got another one coming out in four weeks. So that one's already been illustrated. So I'm just like on fire with, with trying to help. This, this is just my passion project. I I'm, I'm so love teaching people about communication, conflict resolution. So those are the books. We're going to go over a few tests today. What is the age range? These are written on a fourth to sixth grade level as far as the reading yeah. goes. It's actually 3.8 is, is the reading level if you want to be exact. Yeah. But it's meant for fourth to sixth graders if you're going to read the whole book. If you're going to read just the story portion, you can start in kinder. So the kinder, so people that are younger than fourth grade, you just read the top. You don't, you, and you integrate the skills as you see fit, if that makes sense. But if you're going to do the whole program, it's geared fourth to sixth grade. So that end of elementary school, when they start to shift, is where we're just trying to grab kids right then at that end where they're starting to shift into, into the junior high school. So, um, and a lot of the, the scenarios are kind of fourth to sixth grade scenarios as well inside of it. But it can be used for kinder as well. But you have to use it, you have to do some adaptation. Along with this, on my website, I have a teacher's curriculum or parent curriculum that goes through the books and kind of teaches them how to do things. So test and assessments is another thing that I'm doing to help marriages. And with that, I have six different tests that you can download on my website. You can have your clients use. Part, I think, of um, issues in marriages have to do with them understanding their cues and so being educated that way. I do free workshops. Um, I do paid workshops. I speak at conferences. I do marital mediation. So I just want to let you know I'm doing the work. So, and I just feel like the Lord has told me that it's so important to help people with good marriages. This is why you guys are committed to this profession as well, I'm guessing, right? So that's what's great. Um, so the secret to good marriages, I, so when we use a marital media, mediation model, we talk, them, talk to them, it's more of a doing model. So the mediation model at the end is action-based. So we don't just sit and talk about things. We're drawing action items as we go through the mediation. So it's about hard work, and we try to have people be responsible, 100% responsible, 
for how they're feeling, thinking, acting. We call it raft, by the way. So responsible for how you act, how you feel, how you think. People will come to me and say, my husband it made me angry. I'm like, uh, your husband made you angry? Like, you know, that's the choice that you make. You're responsible for you act, feel, think. We actually go through the raft backwards. So raft backwards because I tell parties you. Because if they say, hey, I feel this way about the marriage, I'm like, well, what are you thinking? Like, and there's a study that, that um, or an article actually that was written in 2005, it, it said inside of it um, from the National Science Foundation that people have between 12,000 and 60,000 thoughts per day. And guess what? They said that 80% of those thoughts are negative. And they also said that 95% of those thoughts are from yesterday. So what that means is that if you, when you think, I tell people like their, their little brain, you know, the amygdala inside your brain, it's like the two-year-old inside your brain, just like screaming and dancing. It's always like trying to get your attention and always saying negative things. And so you really have to control your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. So you go through it backwards, thoughts, feelings, actions. Okay. What percent did you say was negative? Eighty percent is what that is what that article said. Okay. So, um, and, but here's the great news about marriage. This is great news. Um, so this is by Eli Finkel. He wrote um, a book that's very long, and some of it's good. Um, there's a lot of interesting topics inside the marriage arena on on a on a scholarly level. And he went through a, a wide array of topics. But he said that Americans today have elevated their expectations of marriage and can, in fact, achieve an unprecedentedly high level of marriage quality. So basically what he's saying is marriages today, the good ones, are happier than your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents. So why do you guys think that might be? Why do you think our marriages might be better? Yeah. Women have more possibility to get out financially. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a big one. I don't have any right answers. We're just brainstorming. If you guys think like I'm like a teacher. I see there's a like greater emphasis on communication. Uh -huh. Far greater than like my parents or my grandparents. Right. Yeah. Greater emphasis. And, and the culture shifted. Uh -huh. So people nowadays choose like to marry for love instead of for financial status or, mm -hmm. or uh, economic gain or, you know, just for survival. Yeah. yeah that's There's more quality in the husband-wife relationship in terms of, like, taking care of kids and workforce, right. things like that. It's seen more as a mutual responsibility than providing. Like, yeah. All of those are really great. Uh -huh. um, I would suspect also that a lot of people getting married today have come from divorces and have that it's like so they've learned some hard lessons and seen what's gone wrong and they also know that it takes a lot of work yeah those are all really great ideas one thing that um that um, eli finkel says it, he talks about marriage in the maslow triangle basically and he says that as a marriage couple we are more easy to self actualize because we have the possibilities of the things you've talked about. More equality inside the marriage relationship. Women, women being able to, to have career and employment and, and vision and goals outside of just the, the home setting. Um, and also just the speed of travel and speed of information. We can do things faster than our parents and grandparents do, did. We can go more places. We have more access to funds and those types of things. And so I, the good news is that marriages, the good marriages are getting better. That's good news from my perspective. So I focus a lot um, on that when I do the seminars. I want to give you my top eight reasons why people divorce from a pr practitioner's perspective. So this is not, this is not, hey, did I do a study on it? No. So this is what I did. I, this is a couple years ago. I went for 60 days and I just tracked every day why the person was divorcing. I just did a little tracking. And these, these eight things captured 95% of cases. So I'm not saying that this, when people report why they're divorcing, sometimes it's different than what um, a practitioner is going to see. Because you, you read in a lot of the literature, hey, finances are like 
the number one reasons of divorce. And I would disagree. I very rarely divorce a person just over finances. That's usually not the main reason, but the having financial issues is often part of the bottom problem, if that makes sense. So I think that's what you mean, that finances, bad finances is a part of a lot of them, but usually that's not the major reason. That is lower than some of these other things. So um, addictions is my number one reason for divorcing. And this is where you guys come in. We need your help, please. Can you help these people? Because I can't. Can I send them to you? And can you help them? So pornography addictions, gaming di addictions, believe it or not. Did you guys know that's an issue that's divorcing people these days? Um, drugs, alcohol. Uh, so the, that is probably the number one scoop. Number two, adultery. OK, that's not a surprise. That ruins marriage. So I tell people, don't commit adultery. Right? But there's so many ways to emotionally connect with people these days. And so when you talk about emotional adultery that occurs, it's like, wow, it's so widespread. You know, if you wanted to, you could hook up with the girl or boy you like in second grade, because you could find them on Facebook. You know, like, and so we get a Facebook and we'll divorce at least twice a month in our office, minimally, where they can reconnect with an old boyfriend or, or love. So, um, but here's the, where I come in, guys. Anger management and immature and conflict resolution is a major cause of divorces. And a lot of times they have like issues or whatever about whatever, and then they have an event, and they touch each other in some way, and the cops are called, and there's a little nick, and then we get into the legal part of it. But get this, people that are, like you're normal, like you're having a normal life, and then on Saturday, you and your spouse have a staff. And somebody touches some, somebody and pushes or, you know, just gets so angry, slams the door. Or I've seen husbands beat the door in. I've seen videos of all sorts of stuff. And they know they're being videoed. That's the worst part. Um, and then the cops are called. Then what happens? Do you guys know? You literally may never see your spouse again for like two years. You'll have no access to cure. A protective order gets entered by the court. And it's illegal for you to contact them in any way, directly, or through any third party. And your marriage is over in 10 seconds. Over. There's no way possible to cure it. Because the protective order makes it impossible to cure. It's a legal entity that helps people from abuse, domestic abuse. And so if there has been an occurrence of abuse, and the cops are called and a protective order is entered, and you get a protective order within, as soon as the court's open, like within 48 hours, you can get a protective order. And you can never contact your spouse again until after the divorce is done. No opportunity to cure. None. It's a big deal. And lawyers use it all the time to their advantage. It's a big deal to the courts. It's a big deal to the judges. It affects your custody. You know, so, so anger management is, and, and, you know, a lot of times you guys know this, right? That most people think of abuse like, the Sleeping with the Enemy dude. Did you guys see that spooky movie where like all the cans had to be straight and like you know like, these freaky like controlling you know? But what I see most of the time is normal people like all of us that are stressed to the max because of money and life situations who lose their temper and they have lost their temper in 20 years four times or whatever, you know what I'm saying? And, and the studies show that if you can educate people, so they have, they have these two different categories. They have the intimate terrorists, they call them, which that's a freaky name. Mm -hmm. And then they just have the conflict resolution issue people. The people that follow the conflict resolution issue, it can be resolved through education. It's that simple. And so that's why I'm so big on educating people. That's why the assessments we have can help people to understand differences, and we'll go over some of those today. Um, health or mental health issues is a big cause for divorce. And would you, it's so weird when people come to me and say, well, my therapist said that my husband is a narcissist. I'm like, seriously, they did not. Because your therapist is not going to diagnose somebody who didn't come. You know, or my therapist said, they're gaslighting me. And you're just like, so mental health issues, major, major cause of divorce. 
That's why we need you. Please help these people. Very, very, very big deal. Um, avoidance or lack of communication. Smart marriages say that 90% of marriages end, why? Because of perpetual avoidance. So I have a friend um, who's been married and she had a night with her husband, they were holding hands, kissing, hugging, loving each other, talking normally, and then the next morning she got a note from him, um, I'm leaving you and there's a thousand dollars for you under the mattress and her divorce. And then she's and then he's never talked to her again since. I did a divorce um, where I was actually the attorney a year ago, similar situation. Like one day she goes somewhere, she comes home, everything's moved out with a note on the door and leaving. Like, this is a very immature and avoided way to deal with a relationship. Don't you guys agree? So, when you talk about being a peacemaker inside of the home, a lot of times people say, oh, well, that means, like, not physically, not getting angry. Well, there's that pendulum, right? To be a peacemaker, a true peacemaker, you can't have, be angry and you can't avoid things. And so that's, that's where I start drawing and helping parties inside my marital mediations. Um, lack of regular intimacy. It is probably one of the easiest measures. Like, if I was going to put my thumb up, if there's one question I can ask a couple, I would ask a couple this. When is the last time you were intimate, and what are your regular intimacy patterns? If they are not intimate twice a week, that's a problem. It's that simple. And so a lot of couples will come and say, hey, and I'm sorry I'm making you uncomfortable to talk about it, but we're all, we're all in this profession. We have to talk about these things. But I wish people would get the word out. I mean, studies show that, that, it, that the national average is somewhere between 1.5 and 3 times per week. People need to know this. That is what's normal. That's what we should encourage our parties to do. Let me tell you the most common pattern I see as a practitioner that divorce people. You guys help them stay married. That's a better profession. But here's what I see, and you might say, Tamara, you're wrong, and that's fine because I'm just going from my experience. I'm catching the worst ones, right, that don't make it. Your filter might be a little different. But So two-thirds of divorces are filed by women, and so you get communication gaps that occur. Let's just say that the husband is logical and the woman is emotion-based. Let's say that the wife needs validation and the husband needs to do right. Okay, like the, so their communication patterns are stacked, and the husband is an engager in conflict, and the wife is a avoider in conflict. So all these bridges are missing. Like, and we'll go over some bridges as we go through. All the bridges are missing. And so wife starts to feel unappreciated, but she's an avoider, so she doesn't express it. In a way, she expresses it, but in a passive-aggressive way, not in a, hey, let's sit down and talk about this in a, in a couple's counsel type of way, right? And so... So then husband really makes her mad. And then, what's your defense? Shut down. Shut down. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not going to have intimacy with you. Mm -hmm. so, that's, so that's what I've been, I'm going to withdraw. And there's a women's group going through Utah that is telling people, telling women, it's your body, it's your right, you don't have to have intimacy unless you feel fully connected with your spouse. Trust me, most people are not fully connected with their spouses. So I'm getting all of these divorces, and I'm hearing it's been five, six, seven, eight, ten months since intimacy. So, but I'm just trying to show you the pattern that I'm seeing, right? So we get the avoid. So this is it, it ties. So we have avoidance and lack of communication results in a lack of intimacy. Okay. So now we have a lack of intimacy. Let's just say for four weeks. That's a long time for a person. If you didn't know, that's a long time. Okay, so then what happens, do you suppose? Another one on the list happens. The guy stops believing in God. <laughs> faith crisis. Yeah, he has a faith crisis. He gets into pornography, which is a trap door from his, from his childhood. You know, whatever the... Do you know the trap doors from your childhood, the little things you did? Because things get stressful. Or we get an anger management issue come up because we're not getting needs met. Is this making sense? Do you guys see this too, or is it just me? I'm seeing the ones that don't make it. If I could have one 
them, like, how's your marriage doing in the wind, I would say, how's your intimacy, how regular are you? And it's not something you really ask people, right? That's weird. But I'm just telling you, that's the thing. And so uh, my next book that's coming out in six weeks is an intimacy book. And I hate to have to write it. I absolutely hate it. I didn't want to write it. I've been fighting with the Lord about it. Like, I don't want to write this book. I don't want to be known as the intimacy girl. Like, I don't. But I had to write it anyway. So, um, but regular patterns. I tell people that aren't good at intimacy, fine. Don't be good at it. Just do it Thursday, Sunday. You don't have to be good at it. And I also tell people, if you want a sexy body, do you know what you do? Number one, you have a body. Number two, you have sex. That's all it is. <laughs> right? It's that easy, you know? So, so intimacy is a big deal as far as the divorces I see. Most people that are divorcing have patterns of lack of intimacy. It's a big deal. So you guys as therapists need to check in on it. Make sure Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday, Thursday, Sunday. I don't know why therapists won't tell people directly that. But I'm telling you, if you empower people to say, I can use that as a weapon, it's not part of our regular patterns, then it escalates other things as well. So, um, and then, um, faith crisis. So people marry a lot of times with a certain faith in mind, right? And so I do marital mediation for newly, for engaged people. It's my most favorite thing to do. I have them take five assessments and they sit down with me for two hours. And we go through all their communication assessments and like we're in marital mediation about building systems. And we build bridges on every cue that's different. And inside that, FERS is my big thing. So F is faith. And I say to them, because a lot of people in Utah are married in the temple. And I say to them, make your faith a part of your marriage commitment, not your belief commitment. Let me explain why this is. I have thought so deeply about how to solve these faith crises. And I thought, it's hard to solve them at the time. And it's not going to solve everybody. I know you guys are going to say it might not work for everyone. I get it. But it works for some people. So if you guys, you guys did anybody do premarital um, edu education or therapy? Okay. It's for you. Okay. So... If they're doing, if they're having, so I say, hey, okay, I ask them one question. Would you marry your spouse if they weren't the faith they are, if they were a different faith right now? And if they say, no, I wouldn't. Like, they have to be my faith. Like, that's part of my, then, then you explain to them, this is part of your marriage foundation. Right? And so I, then I say to them, I want you guys to make a marital commitment to one another. That you will attend your church services and pray as a couple every night. And I want you to pray for your marriage every night, regardless of your faith, regardless of if you have a crisis. That's part of your marital commitment to marry each other today. So when the faith crisis comes, they've made a commitment to still attend and pray. Those two things. I'm not asking for a bigger than that. And it solves some, but not all. But even if we can solve some, right? even if you can solve some. And then you, we also talk to them about intimacy. That's the I, twice a week. Actually, for newlyweds, it's much more common three times a week, by the way. So twice a week is like a slim sandwich for newlyweds. The newlywed studies come up way higher than that. Um, and, then, um, the, and then also, <coughs> actually, the F is finances. The I, I'm so sorry. If you really, if you're tracking, you're going to not care. F is finances. So I, I talk to them in my, in my session for premarital about budgeting, you know, just about education, or how are they going to save, meeting with financial planners and, and finances and things like that. So it's F-I-R, so um, finances, intimacy, religion. And then there's one more R, because I always have to sneak it in. And I put that R inside your packet. So your pa this is the other R, and it's rules for conflict resolution. And this is, I, I would consider myself a conflict resolution expert. I have um, been mediating for 20 years. I have, uh, my bachelor's is in communication and psychology. I've, I've attended Pepperdine courses. I mean, I have done everything possible, learned everything. I, I, I attend a seminar every year on conflict resolution, every single year. And so this is Tamara's top 10 ways to resolve conflict. 
and then top 10 things to never do in a conflict. I wish that newlyweds would know, don't touch each other when you're upset. I wish newlyweds would know that. Because they, they push or kick or do something dumb, like because they did that with their sister or brother, because you model your sibling conflict inside of early marriage, you're most commonly going to model what you did with your siblings. And if you grew up, as my husband grew up as a boy with three brothers, they do not solve conflict the same way as me, where I grew up with five girls. To, you know what I'm saying? So I, I wish that people would know these ten rules. So I just gave them to you. That's my wish, and that's what I teach. Um, and then also, look, fidelity is such a big deal in marriage. It ruins marriages. Infidelity ruins marriages. Do you guys agree? So there's my five rules. And actually, people hate it. They hate it, by the way. I've been on social media about it, and people are like, I'm not going to unfriend my people that I dated or kissed. That's so dumb. I'm like, fine. Then your marriage will suck. You know? So I know that some people, like my friend, she's really liberal with her fidelity rules inside her marriage, and I know that some people will have exceptions to the rule. But I, I tell people to cut off contact, including social media, of anybody that they had a past relationship with. Anybody they kissed, held hands with, and anything with, or even just had feelings for. We're done with that. And then if there is any contact made, I say tell your spouse within 24 hours. For friends of the opposite sex, sex I say, Hey, make it a joint thing. And it's fine to have friends, but like include your spouse. For other people you work with, try not to be alone. Avoid pornography. If you have an incident, tell your spouse. And if you begin having feelings for a person, cut off contact, talk about it, change jobs, whatever it is. So I wish that everybody would know these five rules. Because I think if they had rules and they talked about it, and that's why they're in this book. Because I believe if people will dialogue about things inside a marriage, it makes a difference. I truly believe it. Because people tell me, well, Tamara, how do we do it without you like babying us through? I'm like, answer the questions. And then call me if there's a dispute on the questions. But you guys, they got to do their own work, right? But guess what most people do? They get married. Do they have rules for fidelity? No. Do they have rules for conflict resolution? No. And then rules get breached. Why? Because they don't have any rules. There are no rules. So if you can help people do those things in your therapy, I think we'll make it. Do you? I do. Yes. Are these different areas in the 365 questions book? Say again? The 365 questions book. Yeah, does it, these. does it give you ideas like this, like the different areas that they yes. focus on? Yes, okay. it does. It does. So it's kind of a, a sneaky book, a tiny bit, because uh, uh, just a little bit. Because like I ask quest leading questions inside. I'm gonna tell you, like I couldn't resist. I ask leading questions in it. Like for example, so I give them the fidelity rules, or in the intimacy section, for example, I ask a question. If you, because this is what I tell people, if your spouse initiates intimacy and you just can't do it, I tell people do it if you can, right? But if you can't, then within 24 hours reengage. Right? So I ask a question, would you be willing to re-engage within 24 hours? So a lot of it has leading questions to lead people to healthy marriage practices. So it gives information and questions, questions, not just, not just questions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and then finances, and for many reasons, that's a big issue. But we're not going to go too much into that part today, okay? But I'm sure you guys deal with it. But we, I have budgets in here. I have all sorts of, you know, financial things that we see. So the, as far as um, what I do in my passion project, which is helping couples stay together instead of helping them divorce. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Are you guys so sad when your couple's divorced? Are you, like, emotionally bonded in it? Or is it, like, no big deal? It sucks. It sucks? And sometimes you're like, you need it. I do hate that when they come to divorce and they're like, my therapist told me we have to divorce. I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, but I don't think you should ever recommend it. I think, I believe that breaking the marital covenant should only become between that person and God and that you shouldn't be held accountable for their decision. So that's my opinion on it. It should be a personal decision. Just like you wouldn't tell someone you have to marry that person, you know, I don't think you should also tell them to divorce. But I hear a lot. 
my therapist told me we should divorce. Because remember what I talked about, a person has to have one person underneath that they're sitting on the shoulders of? A lot of times that's therapists. It's really sad. And so I try to find therapists who will never recommend it and work with them as long as they want to keep trying, um, which I call a pro-marriage therapist. And I give a lot of referrals because I work with a lot of people in this, divorcing people, but I will, I will always try to make sure that I have a pro-marriage therapist instead of a pro-divorce therapist. Because I really do feel like the accountability for divorce should be between, should be a, a spiritual decision. I mean, that's my opinion. And we can differ on that, and that's okay. Um, so I've already kind of gone over these things, but this is what I do. I do premarital mediations. As I told you, it's a two-hour session with assessments. I, I have tests for assessing styles. You guys can access those tests on Mindful Marriage Without Love um, if you want to. It's a cost. I can't remember how much it is, like 10 bucks or something. And your clients can take the test and you can assess. Marital mediation for conflict resolution is another thing that I do. And so that is where I've been having a lot of really great success. So I've had couples and I've been doing interventions and mostly that's really bad interventions like the cops at their house and they're separate, like they're moving their stuff out and then it's all of a sudden they're like, we can't do anything, we've got to call it the armor, right? So, but it's really cool. Within a 21 day period, so I use a scale from zero to 10 as far as where they're at on their satisfaction for marriage. So I use a zero to 10 scale and I have been successful in my one-on-ones with people, I have them. Ass- I always do the same thing. I have them assess their conflict styles and different. They do different tests. Then we talk about it and we build systems. So maybe our minor mediation is always the same, but they have gone from a zero and a one to a seven and an eight on marital scale within 21 days. That's the success I'm finding within a three-week period. I can grab them from zero to eight. I found. Because I do a lot of seminars, so I like to do seminars is my favorite because I feel like I can influence more people, if that makes sense. Like one-on-one, it's like, I'm going to have to teach you and you and you, you know. But not everybody can learn seminar style because they need the specifics, you know. But, um, but what I found in the seminars that I do, and I probably, well, if you count education, there's probably more than a thousand people that I talk to or couples or professionals every year as part of my passion project. But I find, that, I find that most healthy couples range on a scale from 0 to 10 between 6 and 9. Does that make sense? So one kind of exciting program that I have going right now is this proactive marital mediation. It's for people that are 6, six 7, 8, or 9. So they're doing good, but they want to get to 10 out of 10. And it's a project that I've worked on with me and my spouse. So that we could both get to on the satisfaction from zero to ten. I'm a ten and he's a ten. And so we figured out how to do it. And there's a process I go through with getting rid of marital garbage, assessing your style, figuring out how to do the connections. And so the proactive um, marital mediation is really exciting. And it's trying to get, but I'll tell you what, when you get to ten and your spouse gets to ten, it's really like being a twenty. Because it's like, wow, I can make you completely great and you can make me completely great and there's just like this synergy that happens that that creates it there and I I have a 10 out of 10 marriage so I know that it's possible and I would like to tell you also that my husband and myself um, we dated in high school we love each other so much after we got married we thought we were birds of a feather flock together but see he's a convincer and so he was super suave when we were dating and chill and great and his his, I was his target, and he romanced me, and he dined me, and he said all of the right things, and then we got married. And the prize had been won. And after we got married, we realized that we were actually opposites attract. Because when, you, when we go through the assessments I give people, we are different on most of the scales. Almost everyone, except for spontaneity, and we are both people persons. But everything else, we were, we were totally different on the scale. And so we had, to, so the reason that I'm so, I like to speak out so much about marriage is because I have a lot of work to do in my own marriage. I mean, a ton of work to do in my own marriage to make it healthy. And now here we are, 25 years later, yes, we made it to 25, um, 25 years later, and we're both 10 out of 10. 
And if I would have known about thinking about getting me and Jake to 10 out of 10 sooner, I would have done it sooner. But I didn't, the thought didn't cross my mind until like three years ago. I'm like, hey, Jake, where are you going? This guy was like eight. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm seven. Like, we're good. And I'm like, let's try to get to 10. You know? So it's really an exciting journey for people to do proactive neuromediation where the goal is to try to satisfy um, one another. And it doesn't mean you don't have what I call black boxes. So it doesn't mean you have your house paid off, you don't have debt, your kids aren't out of control. Like, so there's these black boxes, right? Inside, so I'm saying it doesn't mean you have a perfect life. So don't get me wrong. It means that you guys know how to match one another in a way that makes the other person satisfied inside the marriage. But it doesn't mean the other cues outside of your life are perfect. Right? Does that make sense? And people that are birds of a feather flock together, which is a couple that I helped two months ago in the um, marital medication for conflict resolution, they were about to divorce. I, I got them. And they're birds of a feather flock to a gather couple. Like they have all these common interests. I'm like, what happened to you guys? They didn't have conflict resolution rules. That's the simple. And then, guess what happened? She got her feelings hurt, emotion, she withdrew intimacy, then we had, I mean, it's the same darn pattern that I see a lot. I see a lot. So anyway, that's exciting. I, as I told you, I have my Mindful Marriage course. I video for that course every single month. And I mean, I, I do it because I love it. I mean, do it for just 10 bucks so people can do it. It doesn't even cover the cost of producing the dumb thing. But I'm so committed to helping good marriages. And then as I already told you, we've got the book. So I want to just tell you a little bit about mediation. I don't know anything about your therapy techniques, but I just wanted to educate you a little bit on how marital mediation works and how it's all, and, and what it is. Is that, is that helpful? So we start with an opening statement. Um, and we just set expectations for the party. And it's also our fee agreement and things like that. So that's how we open. Um, and then communication, so there's three main phases of each mediation that we do. Communication is active listening and, um, and helping the parties feel heard and understood. When I talk about communication, I think of it um, in four parts. You, do you guys do, this might be so basic, you might all know it. But I'll go over it anyway, is that okay? So we have party one. Because remember, as a mediator, my specialty is communication, conflict resolution, negotiation. You have to know. And action plans. That's all I do. I don't, if they need their inner child issues worked out, I'm like, I have a good referral for a therapist, right? So, I mean, as far as like inner child and, you know, all of those things and abuse in the past, like, I don't do, I don't do that. I have to work hand in hand with other professionals. So I wanted to let you realize that marital mediation can't fix the individual that needs individual therapy. They're separate, right? So that's why, you know, that's why we work hand in hand. So all I do is communicate, negotiate, action plan, conflict resolution. Those are the four things that, that's all. That's all I do. Okay, so we've got party one. We've got words that are expressed. And then we've got the meaning of the words. And then we've got party two. So then we've got the words received. And here's the, obviously the most important one. The meaning received. So I had a miscommunication with somebody. We were texting, and I, it was actually my producer that helps me do this mindful marriage video thing. And um, we were texting back and forth, and I thought we were meeting at her house at 11, and she got from the same words, like, there's no mistake that the words were communicated identical because we were texting. There's no mistake. The, the words were identical. And then she ended up at our Orem office at 11, and I was at her house at 11. And so what happened was that the words that were expressed, the meaning was different. So this is where I try to capture people inside of communication is, and you know people that mince words? 
So foxes will go into, but some styles of communication are famous on mincing words. Like, you didn't see that, right? Like, oh, do you get that? Mint, 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 words, words, words. They never get to that underlying meaning. The most important thing I believe with the couple's marital mediation I do is not the words, but the meaning. And then I ask them, well, what? So here's the classic example I like to give. Let's just say hypothetically your spouse came home from work late. Just hypothetically. And then the other spouse takes from this a meaning that they're disrespectful and disrespecting them and don't care about them and don't love them. What do you think? Is that a true meaning? No, right? They're extrapolating all of these things. So I tell people, ask what the meaning was. Ask why did they communicate it? So what was their purpose? And guess what? Sometimes spouses mean to be me. You think that's true? Yeah. So then what? Are we stuck? No, then you ask the second why. So this is the formula that I use. Then I ask the second why. Why? Are they being negative, right? Why? Why? Okay, so yeah, he meant to do that. But why? What's the context around that? And that's the little communication model I use. It's so simple. <coughs> there are six parts. The words expressed is two parts. And then meaning of words, two parts. And then why, why, two parts. But here, I don't let them say, why do you think they communicated it? Like in your own brain, I have them flip. We call it a role reversal is what we call it in, in mediation talk. I say, no, no, no. I want you to actually be the other person. I don't care what you think about, you know, I want you to actually be the other person. Why do they communicate it from their perspective? I know you're not that, but just as much as you can give me. Okay, they really did mean to be negative and mean. Well, why is that? And almost every single time, those six parts get me to the foundation that I need to start building systems and resolving conflict. Is that helpful? So anyway, and then um, after communication, we've got the negotiation phase, which is, um, this is where we develop systems inside of the marital mediation. And we're gonna go a little bit over systems. And then um, we always in mediation come up with an agreement. So we don't ever, they don't ever leave saying, oh, we just talked about things. That's not the purpose of mediation. So mediations are action-based. So we always have a plan and you're gonna do this and you're gonna do this and this and this and this. Okay, um, but my, my list, actually, if you wanted to know, um, that I make all my couples that are working with me in marital mediation, they have to pray together for their marriage every single day, without fail. They have to have intimacy twice a week. Like, I'm like, if you want to work with me, like, I'm, I'm booked out till October for divorces, and so when I do a marital mediation, I'm squeezing people in. So I only like to work with people that are actually committed to the process. Have you guys worked with people in therapy that are just like, not real, you know? So I really ask my, my people that I take time off to do it, but they actually do the work. And if they're not willing to do the work, I'm not willing to continue with it. So I'm kind of a strictie on that. Um, only because I'm squeezing people in. Like I have to go into the office two hours early. We do like 8 a.m. sessions for people. So I'm doing it before I'm mediating the divorce for the day. It's kind of fun. Like, hey, I just helped someone out and I'm divorcing you. You know, it's like... A mixture of a day. But, um, and so we ask people to do those things. I also encourage every couple I work with to do what we call, I call a couple's powwow. I have a worksheet that I use. And, um, and I, did I put it in here? I can't remember. Uh, I did not. Okay. I have a worksheet that I use, but I, because when you talk about conflict resolution, the best thing that I found to teach couples is to be proactive. So in other words, you, when you're on your conflict track, so there's two tracks in communication. There's the communication track and there's the conflict track. And people will come to me and say to me, when they sit down for divorce, like they'll sit down and say, I know that he seems like a really nice guy, but he's really horrible. He did this, he did this, he did this. And you, know, you sit down and he seems like a nice guy. And what that really means is they never got their anger management track in sync, right? 
And so, and so I have people, I encourage them, my number one thing for communication and conflict resolution, I encourage them, is talk about problems when you don't have problems. And you're going to say to me, Tamara, that how can you talk about problems when you don't have them? Well, you build systems, which we're going to talk about what that means. And you sit down once a week. I tell people to do it on a Sunday. And you just talk about things. And you don't talk about them when you're angry and upset and in the moment. You talk about things you know, on your regular communication track instead of your conflict track. And guess what? That is the magic. So um, it's time for you guys to take some assessments. I thought it'd be fun to do some assessments and teach you some of the cues. So the first assessment is right there, um, the Deming test. And then when you guys are done taking that assessment, um, I'm going to do, this is just a short Ms. Martin test that I'm giving you today. So, uh, so start on the Deming, and then I'm going to put up the Martin test for you guys to take right after that. So the, the Martin test is, um, I have the answer sheet for you guys on page um, three. Yeah, on page three. So you can take those questions. I have a Deming test like this too, but for presentations I use the shorty. But there's a real one on my website that you can take with the actual, which the actual questions. So I'm gonna have you take Martin and Deming. Are you guys clear on your instructions? Okay, perfect. I did a seminar, so I do these mindful marriage seminars. They're intensive seminars, and I do a Friday night date night, and I do a Saturday all day seminar. And it's the same thing that I always do. I teach people conflict resolution, communication, negotiation, systems, action plans, accountability. So, like, th that's all mainly that I do. So in, in one of these seminars, one of the feedback I got from one of the husbands that came, and most people that come to these, by the way, are like normal everyday marriages, like six to nines. Some of them are in deep distress as well. But I try to sell it as just like, come strengthen your marriage no matter where you're at on the scale. So it's not all distressed couples that, that come to these seminars. So um, in one of the seminars that I did this year in Arizona, the, um, the review came in from one of the husbands and said, if, if you know that your wife is upset with you and has been but aren't sure why, come to this seminar and you will find out all the reasons. <laughs> I thought that was so funny, but he was telling me how interesting it was to see the problems from a perspective, a foundational perspective of, well, did you realize this is your difference? They're like, no, we didn't realize that. Oh, well, once you know what the difference is, it's easier to cure. So what I'm telling you is a lot of people have problems, but they don't know what the problem is. Isn't that weird? They have a problem, but they don't know what the problem is. What they know is we don't get along. What they know is we fight a lot. What they know is it's not working. But they actually don't know what the problem is. So part of conflict resolution when I mediate, when people come to me with, with issues, and boy do I see issues, it looks like this. That's what their problem looks like when they come to me. And they just spew out all this information that this happened, this, 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 this. So, so that's the communication phase where I'm just getting this spiral of information. It's just crazy. Like, and, it's, and some people are cluster people, so they pull from all these sources and they jump topics and you know what I mean? So it's just a big mess. And so the, the thought that I have as a mediator is they have a problem, but they don't know what their problem is. So I go through and I divide the problem into sections. So, have you guys ever cleaned out your garage or cleaned out your den cabinets or something really that you didn't want to do? So when, so I just did this. I just cleaned out my den cabinets. They needed to be cleaned for probably five years. And there was so much junk in these cabinets. It's like the place where you put all the junk that you don't want to deal with. You know that space? Does every, I'm probably only one with like that big of a space in my house, right? So all my den cabinets, I mean, at first it was just one cabinet, by the way, that was the junk cabinet. And then over the years, like, the junk started to take over the other cabinets. Before I knew it, literally every cabinet in my den was just filled with junk. So the process of this, I'm comparing it to problem solving. So when I first got into fixing these cabinets, I took everything out of the cabinets. And if you would have seen my den, it was so 
So it's like you're cleaning. Why does your den look like you just had an explosion in here? I'm not kidding you. Like everything was everywhere. So you have to normalize the fact for, for people that at first it gets harder before it gets easier. And that's hard for people because people are used to instant gratification. They want to be on a diet. I've been on a diet for two weeks and I haven't lost 10 pounds. It must not work. So marriage is not the quick diet plan. And so you have to normalize for people that before the problem gets better, it gets a little worse. And then here's the other problem that occurs inside marriage of the couples I work with. Is you get some um, positive flows of information going back and forth and things seem better. And so when people fight, this is the analogy I use, is that people put their heart inside of some armor. And they do that and we get defenses so it doesn't hurt so bad when people shoot the arrows at us. So we, we put our heart in this armor and then the shots don't hurt and when they come you just shoot back and you shoot back and forth. Well, you did this, well, you did this, well, you did this, well, you did this. Right? So you've got your heart in armor. So part of the process of this mirror mediation is taking the armor off the heart. And then... Habit is a hard thing to change. It's difficult to change conflict resolution patterns immediately. They, and even like you guys work with people with addiction, same things that I see through the divorce process, like it's hard to change it like the cold turkey just one day we're stopping. Most people go through a process. It's the same process that we use inside our marital mediation is just the fact, I, I'm trying to be clear, that it hurts really bad because they take the armor off their heart, and they're like, oh, things are going so much better. And then they go back into a habit-based fight. I'm calling it a habit fight because things trigger and they're back into their habit. And then they get stabbed, but it hurts deeply because their armor is off their heart. It hurts more deeply. So the reason people put armor on their heart is because it makes them endure in these relationships that aren't working and not feel the same. So, so when you talk about the process, it's a big mess, it gets messier, and it looks like this. We're getting better. It's like this is the process we see. I don't often see this process. But you know what the most often process I see? which means we're getting better, it got worse, better, worse, okay, forget it, I'm done. It's a process of good and bad, and you're just trying to, you know, to, to egg them up through. When I do the big interventions where cops are called and they're, they're filing for divorce, when I do those, like I'm saving their marriage intervention, they meet with me, they meet with me again three days later. They meet with me again seven days later. They meet with me again 14 days later. If I'm not there to intervene on a constant basis, I cannot get them out of it. it. It's impossible. Their own skill base has sabotaged their marriage and it will continue to do it very continual. And then after I do the two-week space, then I try to do three, you know what I mean? And, and do the space more often. But the intervention, the interventionist has to be available. And I tell them, don't work about hard problems. Like, just put it on a list, and when you come in three days, we'll work on it together. Does that make sense? So, um, most of the time I want to let you know, my couples where I've done marital mediation for them and it's failed, there's the biggest thing of why it fails is lack of the ability to keep intimacy regular. Which is really interesting. So they cannot keep regular intimacy twice a week, or at minimum I say once a week for couples. But the studies show that intimacy causes oxytocin between people, and it solves problems in itself. It really does chemically, it solves problems for people. And so when people are unwilling to open that, and the problem with intimacy is that there's really, for people that are religious, there's only one way to get it met. And that's with your spouse. And so a lot of really religious people say, I'm divorcing because I can't get regular intimacy and there's no other way for me to access it and keep my core values and beliefs the same. Does that make sense? 
because they don't want to do pornography, they don't want to, you know, engage in other and other actions and all. So that one part. See, but when we talk about the other needs in marriage, the emotional needs, when we talk about the marital virtues, when we talk about recreation, when we talk about time, all of those things can be met by other people. There's only one thing in marriage that can only be met by your spouse, and that's intimacy. That's why I want to let you know that so much of the tipping point on helping couples, that's where the failure comes in. Because I can connect you with your best friend for emotion. I can connect you with your buddy to go fishing. I can, you know what I mean? There's all of these other connections and tie-ins we can use, but we are stuck with the intimate process if you're a highly religious person. So I just think that that's important for you guys to know as professionals, and you guys might see it differently. I don't know, but I see the divorce end of it, and so I'm not sure what you guys are seeing, but I'm just telling you my observation. So this isn't study-based. This is just me working with people. So take it for, for what it's worth, and maybe you guys feel like it's different, or maybe you don't mention intimacy, but you should. Um, okay, so then what I do after we could, so this is what I look like in communication. It's a swirl of craziness, but remember, the question I'm trying to answer is, what is their problem? What is it? What is the problem that needs to be solved? And so here, from here I do some sorting. So I have one sort bucket, of garbage. And it's the same when I did my den. Do you know how much garbage I had? Do you know how much garbage I should have got rid of, rid of four years ago? It's ridiculous. It is so ridiculous what was in my den things. And it's the same thing that happens in marriage. People per perpetually avoid, or they say, I can't bring this up to my wife because she's so sensitive. I hear this all the time. She's so sensitive, she can't take any criticism. So there's no way for me to make a change. I, I can't tell her, or I've tried to tell her. So there's garbage, and I, my big thing when I'm working to the 10 out of 10 is you have to get rid of your marital garbage. Marital garbage, from my perspective, is anything in the past that is still somehow influencing you in the present. It's a conflict from the past that's influencing you in the present. It's garbage. I want people to negotiate and be on the level where, so if you're going to get to a 10 out of 10 marriage, which is a different program, but if you, it's like, you have to get rid of all the garbage so that we're even in today, and then systems get you in tomorrow. It's a future-focused ability for your communication and conflict resolution. But people that are living in yesterday, hey, do you know what I hear? 10 years ago, my husband, and you're like, Five years ago, three, it's like, they've been holding on to these hurts for 10 years, and they've been nursing these hurts for 10 years, and we call, I call them snails in these little books. I introduce all these concepts in these little books. So I call them snails in these little books, and, um, it's actually this one, and, but just imagine how big the snails get. We call them snails because they're slow, slimy, and they have a shell. So you can't really see what's inside the shell. And so, um, and so we introduce it to the kids and to just people about, I don't want to come forward, but we have the snail and we have the angry, angry monster. That's what we're, when we talk about communication and conflict resolution, we're fighting those two. The angry monster is getting out of control and the snail is stuffing things and not coming to a resolution. So how would you encourage a couple to solve a problem that they don't think can be solved from the past. You guys give me some answers. I don't have any right answers ever when I ask a question because I hate when people do that to you. So, just any thoughts? How would you encourage a, a couple to solve a problem that one spouse doesn't think can be solved and it's not from today, it's from the past? Anybody? Yes. I asked him how holding on to it protects them now. Oh, I like that. Or it protects them now. That's a great idea. Because typically people hold on to something either as an adaptive mechanism or as a protective mechanism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really great. Any other thoughts? Well, I should have something to work out recently, but and so um, 
a couple of things that I empathize with them. Uh -huh. So empathize with whatever happened 20 years ago. That's obviously going to have a major effect on them. Sure. And help them to ex express that effect with their spouse. And sometimes their spouse hasn't ever validated that experience, right. which is why it keeps repeating over and over again. Very good. Any other thoughts you guys want to put in the, in the pool? In the thought pool? Thought take? Okay, so um, what I like to do is um, on this marital garbage, I like to divide it into, and I'm speaking on this um, at Education Week, but A, that you can transcend, and transcendence is just a technique where you deal with it yourself and get rid of it. And if you're, they're spiritual people, you can help them tap into the atonement to help with that sorrow or sin or whatever it is. Um, B, what I like to do is to teach <coughs> solve. <coughs> like if there could be some type of solution, let's use, and I we, we use a simple life mediation model. It's called the ABCE model, which I teach to my kids and to the little kids here. And it works for everybody. A, ask. B, brainstorm, C, choose, D, do the plan, E, examine. So that is a, it's a mediation model in like little kid form. I've been teaching it for 20 years in my, when I do character education with yeah. kids. So, but that same model works for anybody. So you communicate, you brainstorm what we can do, then you choose a solution, you do the solution, then you examine, which is the most important part, how it went, what we're gonna do later. And so you solve, um, and then C is share. And I have a share method that I um, share. And so as, so you basically, I have my couple say, are we in solve or share? If they're in share mode, then um, solve is A, B, C, D, E, and share is share. So um, the share mode is S is, so I ask the partner listening. So the one person shares their story. So that's the first part. And then S is you summarize what they said, and I force them to use three to four sentences. Not fine, not good. So I force them to use three to four sentences on what they heard, but not just what they heard. What's Tamara gonna do? Not just what the words were expressed, but what? What they meant, and why did they? Why did they communicate? Why do they need to communicate? Do you suppose? So I go back to these six things inside of communication. I just wanted to show you how they're overlapped. And then H is here, and on the here, and this is a really weird phenomenon that I learned after being in conflict resolution for 20 years. But you have to. I tell them if there's a feeling word expressed, then you have to hear it and say it back exactly. So you can't change. Like when someone says, I'm frustrated, and then they reflect back, you're angry. People that are what I call feelings-based have 55 emotions, and logic-based people have five emotions. So a lot of you people always try to throw the 55 in one of the five categories, and then you don't get pure empathy. So whenever, whenever I'm working with a client in mediation, and someone expresses a feeling-based word, I'm upset, disappointed, frustrated, overjoyed, whatever it is, you reflect that back. Oh, wow, you're overjoyed, or wow, well, you're disappointed. But you can't change disappointed to frustrated. Like, people that are feelings-based choose their feeling words very, very distinctly. And they mean something very special to them. And when you change the word, it's a problem. So I taught this to my son-in-law, and he said to my daughter, I know you're feeling one of those 55 feelings, but I can't remember which one it was, but I know you're feeling something. You know, like whatever they can do, right? Whatever they can do to, to hear it. And then A, I have them ask a depth question. A depth question is a question that shows deeper understanding. It reflects to your spouse, I get it. I get what you're saying. Like, I want more. Like, tell me, well, how did that affect you? Like, did this start now? Is this something in your child? Whatever it is. Whatever depth question they can think of. So that's A for ask. And then the R is to respect that it's okay to have differences inside of marriage. And then E is event of caring. I suggest 
a 60 second hug, and there's literature around 60 second hugs, 20 second hugs, 8 second hugs, by the way. It goes all the way down to 8 seconds. But that helps share oxytocin, which is the chemical that helps solve problems. So I have them, and you don't have to have them hold for 60 seconds, you have them do a sway, like a little sway, or like a little dance. But even if they would just hug for 8 seconds. But, and the event of caring doesn't have to be a hug, it could be a love letter. I, I mean, it could be a gift, it could be going on a date, it could, you know, it could be whatever. But when in doubt, I just teach the hug, because it only takes 60 seconds, which they think is a long time to hug, and it is. So those are how I do, this is what I do with, with um, so we've got garbage, and if you've got garbage, you can transcend it, solve it, solve it, share it, and we divide that into its own category. So we solve we share, we garbage it, and after you solve it, you might be then be able to throw it in the garbage. Or after we share it, and garbage means it's not influencing my marriage in the future in any way. I'm done. So I had a, a case that I helped with where the woman had a miscarriage and didn't feel like the husband acted properly during it. And there's no way to take it back. Like, what he did, it's irreversible. Like, if I could just, like, have a magic wand and let people go back to the day that they wanted to and relive life, would that be better? But I can't. But I tell people, but you can. You can say, I forgive. You can say, I'm going to be better. You can do all of those things. So in that particular case, I said, I said, well, what's the solution? Is there a solution for it? And she said, well... I'm like, what, you're just going to hold on to this garbage? Like, what, what good are you getting out of garbage? What, what is it doing for your marriage? Is it helping your marriage? Is it hurting? It's hurting. And so we just, she decided that she would use the share model. She just wanted her husband to say, like, I get you. I'm sorry. I could have done better. There's no solution. But the share model was basically the solution there. And then I have um, my fourth category I talked about is what I call my DI pile. I mean, you guys have sorted, right? Don't we have the DI pile? So the DI pile is things like, I could use that to help someone else in the future. So I'm going to not like, throw it in the garbage and forget it. Like, I'm going to keep that to the side because that's a DI item. Like, that's like a share with the world and, and be a better person. So, um, so, so we have the problem, then we negotiate it, and we get it into items, so we sort it. So garbage, I tell my parties, if it's garbage, what should you do with it? You should throw it away or recycle it. If you recycle it, you're going to look at it and say, oh, I behaved this way, he behaved this way. In the future, like, we would do it differently. So sometimes I give people, like, a magic wish. I'm like, okay, let's go back in time and pretend like we're back where that instant was. And now I want you to act like now with the information you have later and how much hurt it caused, like, react like you should have. So I give them a review. What do you do? Um, so, and then you have the things you can solve, you have the things you can share, and you have the things you're going to learn from. So that's how we get the agenda organized. And I also do it in my regular mediation. I try to make it as simple and clean as possible. For that reason, I try not to have one spouse pay the debt of another spouse. I try to, everybody to pay the debt in their own name. So that if they don't have a, if they have a non-payment in the future, it doesn't affect the conflict that will spill to the children. And then I do a ledger for all other financial items and try to find an offset somewhere in a different space. So I try to keep them clean. Does that make sense? So you, you want to project I, as a mediator. I'm trying to project in the future what's going to cause problems about what I'm running today. So I try to keep things as clean as possible. proficient. Sorry about that. Um, I tell people that they are the author of their own story, and so that's where we get to the raft model that I talked about before. 
I'm just going to write it up here. Raft is that you are responsible for how you act, feel, and think. And so um, I could tell a villain story of my marriage. You could piece together the 10 worst occurrences and make that feel like every day. I could tell my mind um, the worst things. And I hear, this is so weird. So I'm doing a divorce, and you go into the room with one spouse, and they tell you a villain story. And guess who's the villain? And guess who's the victim? Them. Them or the hero. They're the victim or the hero. And then you go into the other room, and you hear a villain story. Guess who the villain is? The other spouse again. So it's just the most interesting phenomenon from my perspective. And then I draw what's called the third perspective or the objective perspective after drawing from the stories. But the villain stories is how we tell conflict stories to people. And in people's villain stories, they are never the villain. Did you know that? They're never the villain. Or they say something like this. Well, I know that I cheated. But, you know, that doesn't matter because, well, she was your agency for six months. And you, you know what I mean? Like, it's true. And she, she was a spendaholic and this, you know, or whatever it is. Like, these stories that I hear, you never, and some of them, like, acknowledge on this tiny spectrum in, like, this hero way, like, but oh, wouldn't you too? Or, you know, something like that. But villain stories are so interesting. John Gottman's work um, has this model of negative attribution versus positive attribution. And in this, in his work, that when people um, shift from basically a marriage to a divorce, do you know what happens? They, so you see how I have the superhero and the villain? I thought that was clever. That might... My designer, like, did that. But so first they're here, and, like, everything's good and everything's good. Then they hit what I call a breaking point. Most marriages have a breaking point that divorce. And that's the point here where they flip over to the, the um, villain story. And John Gottman says that um, the villain story is where is, is the pinpoint of how he sees the shift. Once people start talking about to others about their marriage in the villain story, and they then look back on things they saw as positive and positive, could they recraft it as negative? Do people have the ability to take something that was great and make it negative or something negative and make it great? Certainly you do. That's why we've got the wrath. I am responsible how I think, feel, act. Thinking comes first. Then feeling, then acting. That's why it's backwards wrath. I didn't like how the tar came out. I thought raft was a better symbol. Like, I, I, I try all different ways how to do it, and I'm like, I just like raft. I like it. I like the, I like the image of a raft. And I'm like a big acronym girl. You'll, you'll know this, because I got share and ABC, because I think when I speak, it helps people remember things more. So I'm always having these weird little acronyms. Do you guys, do they remember the acronym from the eight causes of divorce? I have one up there. It's triple A half. Triple A half. Because I kind of think like you're half, you know, you're half now. Anyway, so I'm always trying to like, because I feel like people can remember more than just giving a list. So the villain story is really important, um, and the hero story is a really important part of the work that I do for communication. So when we talk about communication, this is my specialty. Some of you have heard me sp speak other spaces, so some of it might be a little bit of a review because I talk about communication everywhere I go. There's not one space I speak where I don't talk about communication because I love it that much. But we have to look at communication in its three parts. Yourself, the other person, and then the we is our relationship. And then the fourth part, we're not going to get into, but it's the it perspective is how a third party would look in that's non-biased. And that's what a mediator and a therapist is. We're the it. You know that, right? And that goes back to Boober and the philosophies from, you know, time of all time. So I'm not going to get into all the, all the philosophies of that. But these, the we, I, the I, we, it, like it's been around for ages, centuries. Okay? So this is not new stuff. This is old, old, old stuff. The Jahari window, do some of you guys use that? It's, it's a concept I love. So 
basically your open self, it's what's known to self and what's known to others. And then your unknown self is what is known to others but you don't know about yourself. And then known to others, unknown to self, is your unknown self information about you that neither you nor other knows. And then the hidden self is you know about yourself and, but others don't. So these are the four. We, so actually Covey has a book that kind of talks about, it's the last book that he published with the gray, co with the gray cover and the stripes. What's the name of that book? It's the last one that was published after his death. Darn it, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't thinking I was going to mention it, but he goes over similar things like this, the hidden, the hidden self, but it kind of, Johari is, is kind of the initiator of it from the beginning. So when you have people take assessments, it helps them see things about themselves that are hidden to themselves. And you make hidden things known, and that's what solves issues. Okay. Um, so when I talk about communication, and we, and this is the premise of all these little kids' books that I've written, all of this stuff that I'm talking about, I teach it in little kid form. It applies to adults, it applies in the workplace, it applies to little kids. My quintessential like workplace book is going to come out in two years' time. I've already got them in. It takes so long to get the books produced. Like It takes forever plus five days. And so in two years' time, that one will be out. But in the meantime, I've got all these little ones that have been written forever that are coming out right now. Um, but I just want to let you know, like you can talk, you can teach this to kids, you can teach it to your grandma, you can teach it to your work person, you can teach it to your, you know, it, it applies, the universal. So when we talk about communication, if it's somebody like in an intimate setting where you're working with them a lot, I tell people to use the communication number system. How important is this problem to you on a scale from zero to ten? So you're going to have your natural styles and. Um, I'm going to show you how I teach it to little kids here. So, the, you, can you guys kind of see this page? So, when, when it's little, you know, we tell the kids, well, if it's not that big of a deal to you, avoid it. Or support the other person in what they want. If it's middle deal, this is, is negotiated or teamwork it. Like, that's where good relationships come from, because that's where the we comes from. And if it's really important to you, demand and convince. Now, I'm an attorney. My natural communication style, you guys just did the family test. I'm by nature a swan, a, a team working swan, and a supporting elephant. Now, when you are those types and you decide to go to law school, and you have your first trial, and you get eaten alive. I mean, I think my flesh was eaten alive at my first trial. And the attorneys are merciless. You know what I mean? And you're just like, what? I was like, how did a nice girl like me get myself into a situation like this? So what I lacked, I educated myself. And I, um, Professor Williams, actually, he was like a very famous negotiation teacher that taught at Gerald Williams. He's so amazing. Um, when he was teaching me at law school, I realized, I have a huge lack for the profession I'm seeking. I'm not adequate for it. And so I was like, I'm either going to die in this profession, I'm either going to stay home and not use my degree, or I'm going to learn I'm gonna learn how to do it. And these six styles are how I learned how to do it. So this is just a progression of me teaching people what I had to learn, because I got in the wrong profession for my skill set. And I didn't know it. I, I should have known it, but I didn't know this, and I didn't know that. So, you know, when you, you know, the law should attract people who are convincers and demanders and negotiators, and I had all of the wrong spectrum, right? And so therapy, for the most part, you would, I would think would attract exactly what I am, which is a team worker, a supporter, and a voider. And my, um, my nephew goes to therapy, and he just found like a demander therapist who totally holds him, you know what I mean, like, and loves him, because, you know, so I'm just saying, one of my geniuses in mediation is the fact that I can demand so softly 
that the parties have no clue, and I can convince so softly because I have a softness to me, that they have no clue that they have just been talked to to solving the case. So it's one of, so I'm saying you can make it a charm. I mean, I, I should have had a different skill set, and I failed at that. Because I was born with some of my skill sets, you know, and my family is very soft. My mom's Mary Poppins. She's very soft. She's very creative. I'm creative. We write music together. We do all these creative projects together, which is why my dad has so much stuff in the cabinets. Creative people have a lot of excess junk. Why? Because that scrap of fabric could be made into so many things in the future. I'm not kidding you. It's a whole, so, so, um, so, but you want, but this is where mainly you stick, is in the four to seven, and then if there's something really important, then you demand convince. But my journey myself was that I got into the profession with the wrong skill set, and I was either, I'm going to have to do something different, I'm going to have to just be a stay-at-home mom and not engage in my profession at all, um, I'm going to have to pretend I'm someone who I'm not, which I'm not okay with because congruence for myself is really important. And so I'm like, well, I'm a big girl. I can learn it. And so that's why when we talk about the, the communication spectrum, I don't want people to feel like I'm stuck. I'm born this way. I can't make a change. It's not true. So this is when we talk about the spectrum of conflict resolution, it starts demand, convince, negotiate, teamwork, support, avoid. So it goes on a series of fours. But here's the weirdest part. It's the phenomenon of passive aggressive. So what happens to a demander when they don't get their way? They avoid. It's my way or the highway. So that's passive aggressive. What happens to an avoider when they don't, when they get so much in their, I call it a backpack, what happens? They explode and they become a demander. The reason why is that these end spectrums, demand of an, and avoid, require no consensus with the other party. In other words, they have 100% control. So when you demand, you make a decision, and you say, I'm going to do this regardless of whether you're coming or not. It's my decision. I have agency over what I'm doing. I'm doing it. Does that make sense? When you avoid, you say, I am not going to give you an opportunity to cure the problem. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I'm going to keep it to myself and allow you zero opportunity for cure. You have 100% control. Both of those are very controlling spaces to be at. Does that make sense? And that's where passive aggressive comes. But when you ask me if it's a demander avoiding, it's very different than avoider who's flip-flop demanding. So passive aggressive, from my perspective, has two very distinct spaces, even though the literature and the research doesn't um, differentiate those spaces. And then the four middle styles convinced to support um, are, the, are the parts where you really do work with the other person a lot. Um, I believe that marriage is a treasure from God. I tell people, let's just pretend like your marriage is worth a trillion dollars. So you get married and you have a pile of a trillion dollars behind you. So how many of you would take then, when you first get married and have your first big fight, and scoop off $100,000 and throw it off the ship into the water? People don't want to do it, but they do do it. So that's why I give them. So, so for myself, I'm extremely cautious and careful what I make part of my marriage. When I'm having an issue, I do what's called a thought download. Because I, I want to be responsible for how I think, feel, act. Act, think, feel. So what I sit down, and I'm like, I have these swirling thoughts. I sit down, I write them all down. I call it a thought download. Then I mediate myself. Then I get it organized, figure out what part's garbage, what part I need to DI, what part I can, you know. But I'm not going to, in a raw circumstance, go to my husband and say, I am so upset you today. Like, I would never do that. Because if you go in raw, you have for sure taken $10,000 out of your trade. And there are no refunds, and there are no deposit returns. Like, you have just taken it and thrown it off. Because raw emotion kills relationships. I would never do that. But I will tell you the truth, I did do that for a decade. I did it for myself for a decade. 
dealing with issues raw before I had time to take responsibility for how I was acting, thinking, and feeling. I did it. And I will tell you, it does not make your marriage better. So, I tell people, so the John Gottman ratio, you guys probably know this is five to one. Inside a conflict setting, he says, Parties that want to stay married in a conflict setting have to have five positives to one negative. That's the ratio. So if you throw $100,000 off the ship and you try to cure it, you get 20000 bucks back. Because five, one. To make up for the one negative, you've got to do five things. So you've got to be really careful on what you decide to do on your deposit and return. So the 5-1 ratio is something that I teach in all of this material. And what I encourage parties to do is what's called a quarterly retreat. And it's 24 hours away with your spouse at least. So it's an overnight. I encourage them to go overnight for 24 hours. In it, I have them do my quarterly re- retreat sheet, which um, is... Which Serena is, oh, here it is. Serena is going to fight. Um, and so it's so simple. But what it does, it says, what are the 10 best things about my spouse? And in the retreat sheet, I, from my perspective, if you think about John Gottman's work, well, first of all, do you guys know what the divorce ratio is on positive to negative according to John Gottman? What do you think it is? There is a right answer on this one, but I just want to show you your guesses are wrong. <laughs> That's so bad of me. But a lot of, attorney, right? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> and I'm blonde. Can you imagine all the jokes I get with those two combinations? Okay, so the, the divorce ratio is one to one. If you have one positive and one negative, that's the ratio for people. It's actually 0.8. To one, but I don't do that. So, I mean, if you want to be technical, it's point eight to one. So, I think sometimes people believe, oh, one to one, that should be a good, good marriage. Mm-hmm. One to one is divorce. Five to one is a minimum for conflict. And John Gottman in another thing that I watched, and I'm really kind of a nerd, I should let you know. Like, I, like, read studies for fun over the weekends and watch TED Talks. Like, I'm really nerdy. But in one... <laughs> In one um, thing I watched uh, that John Gottman did, and by the way, he's coming to Utah in September. He is. You should go. I'm going. Um, But September 18th, yeah, he's coming. Um, but, But he said that normal, healthy marriages in every day, the ratio should be 20 to 1. So I I just want to point out to you that the 5 to 1 is negative. So then this is my premise. So let's just say someone comes to a therapist or a marital mediator. Are you flooding them with positive or negative? Negative. So I won't do it. So what I do is we sit down first and we communicate about their positive foundation. What are the things that have worked in your marriage? Maybe not now, but in the past. So let's listen and I go through M-E-R-C-I-E-S-S. I go through every one of my little acronym because I'm nerdy and I have an acronym for everything. So I go... Uh, the Mercy acronym, if you want to know it, is Marital Virtues, Emotional Exchange, Recreation, um, uh, Conflict Resolution, Intimacy, Exchange of Communication, uh, Spirituality, and Service. 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 So we go through all of them and see how they're doing on those marks. And then, at the end of the session... Okay, we build systems around what's working already. We start with what's already working. Because otherwise, you flood their marriage with so much negative, they can't get up. And remember, one to one, and usually when they come to a therapist, they're like negative five to one, negative ten to one. So we're trying to cure the ratio. So first I build the systems on what's working, and then I let them bring up two issues at the end that aren't working, and... And then we, that's how we do it. So we, we chunk the problems really slow. I don't allow them to flood the neuromediation process with all negative. 
because there's there's nowhere for me to go. I did try that though, by the way. I tried just a straight mediation model at the beginning. It worked miserably. I flipped over what we call the parent team model, and it's worked wonderfully. So the question that you start is, you know, what do you love about your spouse? Tell me that. What are the things that are working in your marriage? What's the best memory you had? Why did you guys get married? So I go through a series first, and then I say, but, at, but first I, I talk to them privately and say, you're going to be able to have one issue that we solve tonight. So choose carefully, I want you to think about that. And then we put the other party separate. You're going to have one issue that we solve tonight. Choose carefully, you know. And then so we go through this process of all of these, and I'm tracking the positive things. I'm tracking it. I'm building systems. They're action-based items. And then at the end, I'm like, what's your one item for today? What's your one item? And it's amazing how when you can get the... So what happens in conflict is people turn out off the positive faucets. So the, the things that used to work in their marriage that made it flow, they turn off the faucet. So I'm trying to get that faucet turned back on. So people that used to go running together or have these hobbies together or they'd share spiritual insights or all, they'd stop doing all of those things. So I'm just like, what are the things that did work for you? Like try to turn that faucet back on. And then the quarterly retreat, so that's why they, they bring from 10 things that are going well, they two things they can work on, and this makes a proactive marriage. So my husband and I, I can look at my phone and see what two things are we working on for this quarter. He has two, I have two, he shares 10, I share 10. It's a really simple model. Some people can't do 10 2 at the beginning, so you just do 10 1. But it's a way to know that you're going to proactively work on your marriage and that problems are going to be resolved and you don't have to have these big outbreaks about the problems. And then they also do future focused things like goal planning, vacations, the best dates, you know, and things like that inside the, the, the model. Okay, so I'm not going to spend my majority time on this um, Deming test model, but how many of you guys landed on the lion or the fox? That was your high score on the Deming test. Okay, I'm so sorry. How many of you landed on the demander and the convincer? And you can tell because the last question gives it away. Do you see at the very bottom that, tell, that tells your secret where you're at? So how many of you are the demanding lion or the convincing fox? Okay, great. That's it, just one. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, so you should have been an attorney. I, I demand a lot. Yeah. Okay, so demander and convincers. So for the most part, demander and convincers, they love to debate. Conflict is really fun for them. They often take a position um, they don't agree with just for the fun of arguing. So this, so I had cousins week at my house. We had three teenagers, three teenage cousins from Las Vegas at our house. And two of the cousins, one is a supporting elephant and one is a convincing fox, have been butting heads. So, you know, one's like, yesterday they were debating whether we should have an iPhone or an Android. Right? And, like, this is so fun. One person's getting their feelings hurt and the other one thinks we're having a wonderful time. Right? So, um, for, uh, the, the, the convincers, they interrupt a lot. They have a lot of mind chatter. They think about self before others because they're eye-centered. And eye is really important because guess who can take care of yourself? Only you. So preservation of eye is, is a really important part. Um, they like to be right and take credit I ideas. So I tell people to use this when it's really important. Who do convincers work best with? Other convincers. You work best with yourself in every style. You work best with yourself. But then who do they work next best with? Do you think you could take on a demanding lion? It would be fireworks. Yeah, but it would be, would you get your feelings hurt over it? Oh, probably. <laughs> so, My wife's an elephant, so. She's an elephant? Yeah. Oh, so that's tricky. We'll talk, and that, this is the book you need, right? I have everybody's nemesis. That's your book. So the, the fox and the convincing fox and the supporting elephant have the hardest time connecting. The avoiding turtle and the negotiating zebra, there's nothing that makes a negotiator more frustrated than someone that will not speak their needs to get it done fairly. So they're always saying it's not fair. It's like, if you would have told me, I could have gotten it fair, but you won't speak up. That's that problem. 
His problem is the difference between validating and being right. And then this problem with the team working swan and the lion is squelching creative ideas and automatic no and high boundaries. So when you talk about how, and all of these books suddenly sh share how they don't work, these ones do it, and then how to fix that. So, uh, and then how many of you guys are in the middle with the we team? They're, you're negotiating or team working? Okay, when people take these tests, they tend to come out in the middle because that's like the nice thing to do. But if, but if you really analyze yourself in the next conflict you have, that's what I really want you to think about, whether you really are a team or a negotiator. Because you might be on your everyday communication, but how many of you blink? There's a blink reaction. Fight or flight. How many of you blink fight? How many of you blink flight? So you have to know that you, so I teach the kids the brain. Um, this is the limbic brain, the back brain. This is the amygdala. And then close the fingers. This is your frontal brain. And when you get angry, the amygdala does a peanut push, tries to shut off your frontal brain, and then it takes over. And when the limbic brain takes over, trouble happens and brews. And then once your smart brain gets back on, you don't even remember what happened. And if you teach kids how to turn the smart bait brain back on, by name it to tame it. If they name the emotion, it flips them from right brain to left brain. It goes from big thoughts to words, and it can turn the front brain back on. So anyway, there's so many fun things to teach on all of these things. But I want you guys to think about next time you're actually in a conflict, what style you're actually using. Because a lot of people tend to show up in the middle on the test, but then when they really get into a conflict, they're not negotiating. They're not team working. They're demanding or they're avoiding. So I want you guys to think about it. But the we team in general, they enjoy conflict. They like to compromise. They like to be fair. They easily process conflict. So it's like, look, if you have a problem, talk to me about it. It's not scary. It's not bad. Like, just talk to me. Let's, let's work it through. Um, they like to share. They're creative. They obviously have a whole bunch of cupboards worth of stuff. And because they have a lot of access. The problem that everybody has like an Achilles heel, and the Achilles heel to the team working swan is overdoing it. The Achilles heel to the, the negotiating zebra, fairness. If it's not fair, they just cannot function. And guess what? Life's not fair a lot of the time. Um, so every, every, and the Achilles heel to the lion, the demanding lion, is boundaries. They have such high boundaries. They can't let other people in their gates. They don't have enough fences. The Achilles heel to the convincing box, listening. They're horrible listeners for the most part. But they can be trained so far. They can be trained as such, right? And um, all the bottom line is everybody can be trained as such. You've got your natural tendencies, but you can be trained as such. And then the Achilles heel of the elephant, supporting elephant is they take other problems as their own and they worry, worry. So these kids end up having really high anxiety. They don't worry just about themselves, they worry about everybody. Mm -hmm. And then the Achilles heel of the turtle is fear of working through conflict. Fear. And they literally will do anything to get out of conflict. And so what happens with the turtles is they overcommit. They say yes to everything because they're an automated yes, but they never follow through, so people think they're like you. Anyway, every style has an Achilles heel. So every with the books, mm -hmm. like I'm thinking about my kids right now. Yeah. I don't necessarily know what they are, I have an idea, but is there a test so we know what we're talking well, about? Well, there's explanations in the front for the kids. Okay. And I do have a little test. I can pop it up online for you guys. It's just a little picture test we do for the little kids. So yeah, I've, I've been able to assess kids. I start teaching character education. I have, I taught, I have six kids. I taught in every single child's classroom about once a week for 20 minutes. Every grade K through six, every kid. So, and not only that, I did programs for the Provo School District. I taught at Slate Canyon. So I developed all this curriculum like 15 years ago is when I developed it. It's just been sitting on my computer. And that person's like, you have to post it. I'm like, do you? Like, you know, so I, I developed this a long, long time ago. I've been teaching it for a really, really, really long time. 
my youngest child just got out of the of the elementary phase, and so I am no longer teaching character education on a regular basis. But it's really fun for parents to be able to give back to the classroom by teaching character education series. It's a really great way to contribute. I actually did it in the high schools, junior highs, like elementary. I've done it across across the span. It's just a, and then it's really fun for them to have languages. And the reason I use the animals instead of just the words is because it's just easier for people to remember a fox is sly, you know. So at the demander, I say, you guys can do a character I think would be really quick, okay? So let's just say um, it's over the pen. So the demander says, give me that pen, and here's the clause. Ready? One, two, three. Give me that pen, demander. Thanks, Raymond. <laughs> I mean, I, this is my daughter. I taught it to her all K through six. So um, she's with me today. Okay, so, and I, again, ready? Give me that pen, demander. So the fox puts his tail over its mouth and says, if you give me that pen, I'll give you a treat. Ready? One, two, three. If you give me that pen, I'll give you a treat. Convince her. One more time. If you give me that pen, I'll give you a treat. Convince her. So the sign for the, the reason I do signs is because when I'm doing the interactive games with the kids, they can sign it and don't have to speak and yell out. So it's just a way for us to communicate and the teachers, I kind of sometimes get the kids riled up, to be honest. And so I try to do some things where I'm not always riling the kids up. Um, I know, I'm the worst. The teacher, I'm like, they're fine, they're being rowdy if you like this. But, you know. So this is the sign for the zebra, because half white, half black. So let's share the pen. Um, negotiator, ready? Let's, let's share the pen. pen. Negotiator, again. Let's, let's share the pen. Negotiator. I always have the kids say negotiator, demander at the end, so they're trying to attach the animal with the, with the bigger word of it. Even though the kindergartners don't even know what the words mean, it's okay, it, grow, it goes into their vocabulary over time. Then here's the elephant, because they have big elephant ears. Why do you want the pen supporter? Ready, one, two. Why do you want that pen supporter? Why do you want that pen supporter? And then the final one is the turtle. Here, take the pen, avoider. Ready? One, two, three. Here, take the pen, avoider. Here, take the pen, avoider. So it's really, the reason I wanted to do a little bit of character ed with you guys today, because I just want to show you how simple these concepts are. They're so simple you can start teaching them to a five-year-old. And the studies show, and the reason I'm so committed to this book series of 12 books, and I got four done, and five and five's coming out soon, um, is because the studies show if you can grab kids with these skills when they're in their younger years, they stick with them for a lifetime. And can you imagine your kids being like, hey mom, you know, I was working with Sally today, she's an avoider, I was trying to get her open up, so I asked three times, like the book said, you know, all these techniques and identifying people and where the struggles are and having a language, it's so, I mean, I'm so passionate about it, it's ridiculous. I'm passionate about kids, and I feel like if we can get families and kids working on this when they're young, it's going to make all the difference. I really, really passionately believe that. So it's never too early to start. I'm even thinking, after I finish this 12-book passion project, I'm doing a little toddler series. Like, I have two of the toddler series. It would just be a six-book series, just to, like little tiny simple poems. These are really complex books. Most of the time, um, when I'm doing the full curriculum, we do three 20-minute sessions with the kids. So it's, these books are meant to be one month, one month of character ed. Does that make sense? And then we break it down. So this is like a one-month curriculum of character ed. So each book is one month. And we'll have 12 books, even though there's only nine books of the school year. So you will have to go through and blend or, or teach in a different way. Um, so. And then, uh, the U team, so they want to be compassionate, so they accommodate other people's needs before their own. Oftentimes they do things for other people even when their mind's complaining inside. And they like to be praised. Oftentimes, the weird, so they're others oriented and they're really kind to other people and really hard in their self talk Really, really, really hard on themselves. And so that's the U team of support and avoid. So this is what I was talking about before. 
the number one thing that I try to teach couples. And so this is how, so I, you have two tracks, your everyday tracks up here, your conflict tracks here. Most time when you get a conflict, people blink to the edges. Is there a, like, oh, no, okay, just wondering. There isn't, I was wondering if there was like a little, oh, no. See here, okay, is it? Okay, so I'll just use my finger. I was trying to see if there was a little pointer, but there isn't. So people blink to the edges because the amygdala gets you in that fight or flight mode. So we have people, 20 minutes is what the studies show, like to calm down. So uh, when you get into the unhealthy zone is when you get into, we flip from lion to being an angry monster. So I villainized the edges, by the way. But instead of villainizing my characters, I villainize a different non-healthy portion of it. Really, I was gonna villainize each character because everybody has an Achilles heel, but it just made this series too complex. Like, you know, it's like, okay, well the fox can be the peacock, you know what I mean? Like, because you, right? And so, and I was gonna make a giraffe for the swan because the big long neck, but it just got to be, people, my editor, technical editor, already thinks I do too much in these books because I'm an overdoer. It's like, no, no more nemesis animals. But really, I even though we kind of pick on the turtle and the and the lion, because everybody blinks to those edges usually, every style has its nemesis. Okay? Are there any questions on this? Does it make sense at all? A little bit? So the goal for people and marriages and kids is to identify your natural style, use it when it's working, and know that you have five other options when it's not. So, so I used to teach at the law school, and a lot of what I taught, I taught communication, negotiation, mediation. So this is my life of teaching. And being in here, I'm like, oh, I miss my teaching. I love teaching so much. Um, but we discovered one day as a classroom that the foxes work best with themselves and zebras work best with themselves. We, but then who works best with each other? We learned that the foxes work best with the lions and the zebras like next best so you actually work best with yourself and the touching boxes right so knowing that what I developed and I discovered that like 15 years ago but what what I teach people there's only two styles you really have to know in depth and that is the elephant which has compassion accommodation listening caring, that's the elephant, and the fox, which is convincing, persisting, being able to get your way. Why? Because these two styles work with all six styles. Do you see how the fox touches and the elephant touches? Those two styles work with everybody. Okay, so now we're going to go into the Martin test. So the Martin test is underneath the Demi. So the Demi is the broad test, which just shows people what their communication style is. The Martin test shows the details. Okay, so a lot of times people say, hey, men are this way, all women are elephants, all men are foxes. We know that that's like just a bunch of baloney, right? Because we're individual people. And so I don't get hooked into the gender literature and how it says men and women are because you know how many um, like convincing fox females there are in the law? Tons of them, right? And so you get these flip flops, and so and so we don't really talk about categories that way or stereotypes. So on the on the test, how many of you guys were task oriented? Your taskers on the test. One, how can you relationship oriented? Okay. So task oriented, they find a lot of satisfaction through accomplishing tasks. They find success through completing as many tasks as possible. And they build relationships how? Through activities. Uh, they, communication is for a purpose to accomplish the task. So I'm gonna call you up. Pretend like we're friends, okay? Hey, what's your name? Rich. Rich? Hey, Rich, how's it going? Great. How you been? What's been going on? It was really great class today. Awesome. That's so cool. Yeah. How are the kids? 
Busy. Summer. Yeah, how's your wife? She's awesome. Busy. Good. Air conditioner went out. Wow. She's that's... working on that. What are you thinking right now? Um, what's your point? <laughs> Why on earth are you calling me? And with the task oriented person, you have three questions. Like, hey, how are you doing? That's okay. Fine. Yeah. What's been going on? Nothing much. But then the third question, I should be saying, I'm calling because I need you to do this task for me. Now, before I knew this, I'm a relationship oriented person, my husband's task. I thought it was kind of mean to call someone for a task. I'm like, that seems so tasky, and it might feel like I don't care. Now, when you call a tasker, you should get to the task as soon as possible. So if I said at the end, I'm just calling to talk, what's your reaction? Go. Yeah, you know, like, <laughs> no thank you, right? So, um, so they're rarely going to call a person just to chat, unless somehow it's like, hey, my wife said I have to call her every night to chat, because I'm out of town. Like, you know what I mean? It's not their thing. On the phone. I mean, they might chat, when they're in their chatting box, and that's their task, they're really good at it. So don't get me wrong that they don't have, and the, the cool thing about taskers is, like, your wife has her own big, huge box. And when you're in her box, like you're in her box. Right? Or wrong? I don't know. Yeah. So um, so how do relationship oriented people build relationships? By talking. But see, if I want to talk with Rich, is that gonna build my relationship with him from his perspective? No. What's gonna build relationships? <clears throat> Tasks together, activities together, sort of the movies, we like the boat together, you and your wife. I'm guessing there's, is there a hobby you share with your spouse? We both work from home, so we get in the same room and work together. Is that weird? She does her job and I do mine. That's awesome. Yeah. Right? So I'm just saying, they have, so the coordination of relationship is built through task completion together. It could be fun stuff, it could be even housework, like all of those tasks add up to the relationship. Um, and for the most part, task-oriented people like tasks to be accomplished with efficiency. And so yesterday, we had a family dinner at our house. And I don't know why, but everybody wants to know what their animal is. Like, and I have this little test I do on people's fingers. And they're like doing the fingers, and I ask them questions to figure out their animal. So I'm doing this while I'm doing dishes. We're barbecuing. We've got all these things on. And my husband's like, damn, you've got to get to the court. And I'm like, Jake, I'm trying to figure out what their conflict communication style is. Like, I can't get to the court right now. He's like, what about the court? What about this, right? And I said to them, this is a perfect demonstration of task-oriented or a relationship. I'm going to sit here and finish your communication style assessment, then I'll get to the court, right? So it was just a really good example. We, Jake and I know we're different, so it doesn't bother each other. Like, we know it's a difference between us. Like, I'm always going to drop anything to help anybody with anything else. So because of that, a lot of my tasks are left out. And Jake is task oriented. Did you think he leaves a lot of tasks half done? Mm -mm. Because the way his system works is you start a task and then you finish a task, right? And task orientation for myself is a hindrance to my creative process. Because if you study about creative processes, which I have, incubation is part of the creative process. And so my husband is not very creative. That's not his thing, right? And so we just honor that we have different processes, but just being educated on the difference, it makes a big difference. Relationship-oriented people, satisfaction comes through being compassionate. They usually love to be praised and thanked. They build relationships through one-on-one -on -one communication. Um, they love to communicate about all aspects of their life. So recently, we had a tragedy in our family. My nephew was killed in a motorcycle accident. And the, my best friend that called me and showed up, like that meant so much to me. Like that connection of all aspects of our lives. One of my best friends came to the funeral in Idaho, another one came to the burial in Utah, and I was like, oh, that's so meaningful for me for them to show up in, in those spaces for me. 
So all aspects of my life is really, really important. And then my best friends that didn't show up, didn't call, didn't come, I'm like, ah, oh, that did detract from my relationship with some ways. Right? So um, they love to listen to others. Usually they feel it's noble to call someone just to talk. How many of you have a friend or family member you called just to talk to? Like it's, the purpose is just to talk. Right? Um, they often feel guilty to call for just a task. So uh, when you want to build a relationship with an activity, so this is what you teach your marriage people. How do you appropriately do it? So before I was, before I discovered this, I was like, me and my husband would sometimes watch movies for a home. And relationship oriented. So, and we're home. So what do you think I might be doing when we're home watching a movie? It's a horrible thing I was doing. Do you have an idea? I'm chatting, I'm chatting, I'm talking, and I'm holding on. That did not build, that was not the best way to build a relationship with my husband. And here's why. Number one, I wasn't giving the activity and the right of attention. And that's a big annoyance for a task-oriented person. Would you agree? Totally. So it's like, you're half there, half not there. Are you, are you on a date with me or are you full in on Right? Oh, the the oh my gosh. Okay, it's my pet peeve. I won't get into it. Get off your phones, people. If you're on a date, get off your phones. Get off your phones. And that goes to Cubby's idea of urgent versus, you know, urgency versus what's important and distinguishing those things. But yeah, phones are ruining people's lives. Me and I are going to go on a date, and we always keep our phones flipped over. Like, we won't look at them unless, like, one of the kids is called or something like that. But we look around the restaurant. Do you know what we see people? It's like, are they there in cyberspace? Or could they actually interact with the person across? And then there's all these addiction on phone things going on. But anyway, we won't get into all that. But bottom line, for, for you to build a relationship with an activity, this person you have to give the activity and the right attention. So the women that go to the BYU football games and read books, you're out. Your body showing up is not enough. Because then the woman said, why didn't you bring her? She obviously didn't enjoy the game. She was reading a book. You see? How that, does, it, does that make sense why it doesn't build a relationship? Relationships are, And then, there's another rule. So you have to give it attention. The second rule is, you actually have to like the activity. If you start to complain, that food was so disgusting, I didn't have a good time at the ball game, I can't believe it's like, oh my goodness, I should have brought somebody else. So you have to give it and write it in and you have to like it. You don't have to like it, you just have to not complain. Is that fair? Okay, so then how do you build a relationship with the relationship oriented people? Talk. What do you talk about? Nice. But what if they don't have feelings? What if they're logic based and they only have five things they feel and mainly just two? So my husband is actually in my notes when you said tasks, I said, oh, basically, husband. So, <laughs> um, and for him, like with me, like at first when I would ask him about work, he'd just be like, it was good. Okay. And his job is the opposite of mine, it's like software engineering, knowing everyone would have a therapist. And, um, and so I was like, okay. And I sat him down near the beginning of our marriage and I was like, baby, I need you to tell me what you did today. <laughs> I won't understand half the crap you tell me. I don't understand software to save my life, but I want to understand what you did today. I want to know what your day entailed. And so now he knows when I ask, hey, what did you do today? How did your software thing go? And I might not get when he tells me weirdest stuff about like numbers and things I'm like oh <laughs> but then I'll be like oh did you get this did that guy come in so that you could get this activity done the next day so that way in my mind I feel closer to him because now I know this is what he did today this is yeah. how he did it exactly that's exactly right so you train your spouse to talk about things and I tell my husband he said how was work fine what you did nothing I'm like you did nothing I was like hey I did the same thing with you every day I'm like look I just need you to share one extraordinary camera story from your day at work every day. Just figure out a story. I don't care what it is. I, that's how 
I connect with you. That's, you know, and so then you also train these couples the difference between venting and complaining. The way that relationship-oriented people build relationships is through venting. But it doesn't mean you need to fix it. It means that you need to be the sharing, it being that safe space is what fixes it. Where complaining is where you're wanting an action at the end. Venting is just like, I just want you to hear. So there's a lot of differences on these. Um, so the task, we've kind of talked about these. Be patient understanding, set aside to just talk, give them a call to say hi, give up, give up a task to talk, talk to them one-to-one, -one, praise them at least two times, use the pattern. And um, then for relationships, stop taking things personally because a lot of um, schedule activities and expect no deep conversations. That is not the time. You should not blend these two styles. It works horribly. You, sh you cannot have a deep conversation in the middle of the football game. You cannot. And then I had a husband, he's like, I took my wife out and she wouldn't even talk about it. I'm like, duh, you're in a public setting with people. Do you think she's gonna open up to you in the public setting? I'm like, did I really have to just teach that to you? He's like, yes, you did. I'm like, don't ever do that again. You gotta do it in a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, be, mi be mindful of time when you give a call, give a task, say a quick goodbye. I don't really call my husband at work for the most part unless I have a task that needs to be completed and he knows that. And we've developed a system and he's the CEO of a big business and he's busy all the time. He'll pick up the phone, hey babe, I'm in a meeting, what do you need? And I'll say, my one sentence, he's like, okay, or I'll call you later. Like, but that's our, that's our system. That's what works for us you know, in his workplace setting. Uh, talker versus listener. Talkers like to express their ideas. They interrupt so they don't forget. Did I, you gotta hear that. Why do they interrupt? So they don't forget. Talkers tend to have less long-term memory with the things that they're talking about. So the reason they share it in an interrupting type of way is because they don't remember it if you get too far down the line. Okay. They talk about themselves because they're more eye-centered. They have mind chatter. They say what's on their mind. They do not pick up on hints. They expect others to talk. So it's interesting because people aren't just like fox and zebra. Like you're, you're a blend of these things. So it's really interesting. Sometimes, like my niece, she's such an interesting blend. She's a fox listener. She's a fox and she's, when she shows up, she shows up as a fox. But she's a listener. So you're like, that's weird. My son, uh, one of my sons, he is a fox avoider. So he's a fox, and he's the light of the party, and he's going, and you know, and then when it comes to conflict, he shuts down and he avoids. So don't assess, I, that's why I don't like people pigeonholed into spaces. I just want to educate them, because you're going to have all these differences that come through, and these are the differences I'm talking about. So besides this, the reason I thought, man, if I'm talking to therapists today, like, I want to give you the underneath it. So what I'm trying to say is any style can be any of these underneath, and that's where we get that weird mixture that occurs. Why is my niece a fox um, and she's a listener? Because her mom is the best listener in the world and her dad's a fox. And she was trained in that like extreme you know, environment as they go. Um, listeners, they're great at listening. They give undivided attention. They wait for their turn. They only up and up when they feel safe, and they don't say everything on their mind. So this book talks about the listening and talking phenomenon. And so who feels like they're a really good talker? Will you come up really quick? I'm going to do just a spontaneous demo with him, and hopefully it won't backfire. <laughs> This is a risk you take as a, pre as a presenter. So let's pretend like we know each other because otherwise it would be awkward, okay? okay. Um, I'm just gonna have a wife of him. So, uh, okay, so you like to travel? Yes. Okay, where have you gone? Uh, China, Germany, Puerto Rico, Hawaii. Awesome. Also, I've been to China, I did the Great Wall. Did you do the Great Wall in China? Yeah. Did you do Balkan down? No, oh yeah, we did actually. Can you believe that? Yeah, we got yelled at for going too fast. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I am like tobogganing down the Great Wall of China. It was amazing. Yeah. Okay. So stop. You can sit down. Thank you so much. How would you define, well, first of all, is it Ben? Yes. Ben, did you feel like I was being disrespectful in the way I was engaging with you? No. Did it 
it feel comfortable and normal? Yeah. Okay. So, from a talker's perspective, did you see what we were doing? Did you see what I was doing? If you had to explain to someone that didn't know what talking was in that pattern we just did, how would you describe it? It's called the talking pattern. If this is the talking stick, you'll notice that I grabbed the stick from him, and you, like, I interrupted him purposely. I interrupted. Did you guys notice? Like, I just... You we had to do it well in China, but you know, and guess what he did back? He grabbed it back, and then I grabbed it back, and he and it worked fine, right? Because the rule of the talking pattern, which this one goes into, is that the person that wants to talk just grabs the stick. Does that make sense? Logical? Okay, who thinks they're a really good listener? Okay. That Nobody's going to admit that because you're a supporter. Okay, whatever. Okay, point to someone else who's a good listener. Can anybody volunteer someone that is going to be so mad? Will anybody volunteer because you're pretty, you're an okay listener? That's what I have to say for listeners. Any okay listener? Okay, thank you. Come on up. So I want you guys to characterize, oh, even with the baby. I want you guys to characterize this pattern, which is different than the talking pattern. If you're going to describe it to someone, it's different. And I want you to think about why it's different. So do you like to travel? I do. Okay, where have you been? Um, not really much actually. Going back to Japan and going to Alaska. Oh, that's fun. But just to the so. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> have you been to other countries? Yeah, I've been to Japan. Oh, cool. And I've also been to Alaska. We just actually went to Alaska last month. Oh, wow. How I couldn't believe it. I thought Alaska was going to be like the worst place with all this snow. Right. And we get there and we land at 10.30 at night and the sunshine is up. I'm like, oh, yeah. And we got up at 4 in the morning and the sunshine was up. I was like, oh, this is my place. Oh, you liked it? I loved it. Oh, that's awesome. I loved it. I don't know if I'd love it in the winter. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so how would you describe that pattern as differing? And I waited for her. Did you, I was waiting. You know what I was waiting for? Or yeah. give you something to talk about. Right, so in the listening pattern, the person that is, is, is talking um, keeps the stick, and when they're done, they hand the stick to the other person through asking a question. So she asked me a question, and I just waited for it. Like, I'm like, I'm not, like, I just wanted to see if she'd do it. And there was a little bit of an awkward silence, because we didn't prep at all, right? I just take random people out of the audience. And so she asked me a question, and then it was my turn to talk. So it looks like this. One person talks, you finish all the way to the end, you pass the stick. Another person talks, you finish all the way again, you pass the stick back. Do you see how that? Now let's contrast that to what me and Ben were doing. I grab, he grabs, I grab, he grabs. So when you combine these processes, what happens is a disaster. So the listener will start out okay, and then the talker grabs the stick Right? Because that's how you do it in the talking pattern. And what does the listener do? Just listens. They're waiting for you to give it back and they won't interrupt. They won't engage through when you get extreme listening. And then you get a gap in the way that you communicate. So I think I'm the only communication expert that tells you if you're talking to a talker, how can you tell if you're, do you think you guys could say, Tamara, after this course, I could tell you the difference between a talker and a listener. How many of you think you could tell the difference? between those patterns. You can tell a talker right away because they interrupt you. And then you can test it again. Like grab it again if they interrupt you again, they're a talker. So what should you do? Should you actively listen? No! You should grab the stick back because then if I actively listen to you and wait, you're like, oh, is she going to engage or what? Right? So no, you don't actively listen to a talker. The talking pattern is about interrupting and grabbing back and forth. That's going to change people's lives if you would teach that to your people. Now, in conflict communication, I always suggest using the which pattern? Listening pattern. One person's turn, finish. Other person's turn. But in regular communication, do as you will. When I work with the parenting and the marriages, I let them do the talking pattern with me there facilitating it to show it. Because if they can fight with the talking pattern, 
great. If it's going to work for them, it's volatile, like a fox and a fox married to each other, it works out great. By the way, John Gottman has these same styles, right? But he puts them into three instead of six. Who do you think has better, higher, highest satisfaction? The volatile couples or the avoidant couples? Who, has, who reports higher marital satisfaction? How many think it's volatile? How many think it's avoidant? You're right, it's volatile. The volatile couples have higher satisfaction. Now, the mid couples have the best, but bottom line is, the truth of it is, it's very unusual for people to be married to an exact match of their conflict. Because John Gottman's study only does matching partners if you have the same style. So the unregulated partners show that if you're married to someone in the middle, you have higher, higher satisfaction. Okay, logic and feelings. Logic, they're persuaded by facts, experts in the field. They like to use standards in the industry. They prefer to hear facts rather than emotion. Uh, they like it when people quickly get to the point, and they're problem solvers. Uh, and I say that, you know, logic-based people have five emotions. I don't know if I could name them on the spot, but you, you, wanna, you guys want to help me? Who's logic in here? Help me. You're happy? Happy, sad, angry, scared, and I can't remember the last one. If you're right, what is the last one? Um, I'm sad, I'm mad. Oh, happy, sad. Oh, yeah, wait. I'm happy, sad, happy, glad. Anyway, there's one more. But I don't think it's discussed. It's something else. I'll have to look at it. I know. Oh. That's what I'm like. I don't think That's it is true. discussed, right? That's why it came to my but, um, but basically, okay, so emotion-based people. Give me some of your feeling words that you talk about commonly. Come on. Flow them out. Frustrated. Frustrated. Annoyed. Annoyed. Is, is frustrated and annoyed different? Yes. Okay. What else? Torn. Torn. Great. Disappointed. I mean, there's so many, but they all mean different things at different levels. So they're persuaded by facts and feelings. They want to know the facts, how the facts make a person feel. So um, they like to spend time hearing stories and probing for issues. So to build the bridge with the logic, they need to be patient when others talk about the feelings. Use the share mode. That's the one I taught you earlier. Um, resist giving solutions and understand the exact same feeling may need to be expressed multiple times. So I had one um, seminar that I gave and the husband's like, my wife is in this conflict with her family and she keeps on telling me the same story and I told her, if you can't come up with something new on the facts or something, I don't want to hear that story again. Why is she sharing it? Because that's how a relationship-based person builds relationships. It's through venting. It's through sharing conflict stories. It's through sharing joy stories. Sharing all aspects of life. So those are where the differences come. The feelings-based per person, organize your thoughts before you present them. Write down your main points. Do your homework. Explain only the issue one time and expect your problem to be solved. So I had a problem with... Um, Here's someone kind of gone over these. I'm not going to go into too in depth, but I had a problem where I wanted to get a Mac computer. I did my research for my husband. I did it all. So when you do the deductive process, you start with the solution in one sentence. So you come to him and you don't say once upon a time in the middle of the woods there's three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't give my husband the story from how are stories told? There's a beginning and then what? A middle and then an end. So what do you tell the end of the story? Yeah. At the end, and if you tell at the beginning, it's like a spoiler alert, right? So, but that's not how left spectrum people work. They're like, give me the end. Like, I don't want to hear your story. I don't want to hear the beginning. I don't want to hear the middle. I want to hear, like, why are you calling me? What is this about? Because they listen differently once they have the bullet point. Like, once you tell them, okay, this is my problem solving that I'm then you can give the story because I know where it's headed. So I say to my husband, so I spent hours doing research. I'm like, I want to switch to a Mac computer. Do you know what he said? Okay. He said, okay. I was so mad. <laughs> I was so mad. Because I had researched for like five hours 
and my friend had come over, and I did the comic strip thing, and I, I was did all this research, and then I said, you know, well, can I tell you why? Why should you never do that with a lefty? Once you get your yes, you get out of there because you can convince them backwards. So my, my dad was a judge, and my mom was Mary Poppins, and her name is Mary. And so my, my mom taught me when I was kind of little, like, if you have a, if you need something from daddy, go up to him and tell him exactly what you need. And when you get it, leave. So I would be like, hi, daddy, I need five dollars. <laughs> It's in his pocket. Here you go, babe. Thank you. <laughs> now, if I wanted to ask my mom for five dollars, so how do you engage on the right? I tell the story. My dad doesn't care why I want the five dollars. The purpose on the left is to accomplish tasks with efficiency. Right? On the right spectrum, that is not the purpose. The purpose on the right spectrum is to build relationships and show compassion and care. So they're different. So with my mom, I'm going to be like, if I say to my mom, I need $5, she'd be like, a form. She's going to listen to the boy. Tell me the story. Well, and then you tell the story. So if you just know, so the last second speaks in bullet points. Bullet, 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 bullet. Right, and you just keep on giving bullets. So let's say my husband would have said no. I want a Mac computer. My first bullet would have been, it has some of the software on it where when I buy it separately on the PC, it costs more doing it through the PC. I was really into movie making at the time. It had the iMovie on it. And I'm like, show them, let me show you this little clip. Okay, besides that, that's bullet one. Bullet two, right? And you just go through until finally they say, okay. Now, if you're married to a convincer, um, really funny convincers and good convincers, like when your wife is doing poorly, they actually will, by, you should have said, this is what you're convinced. Like, they'll help you out. They're like, you're failing. Let me tell you what you, what you could have said at this phase. So they'll even help you out as you go through. Um, the verbal versus nonverbal is an important cue. That's where you send and read messages through verbal communication. You prefer to hear the truth rather than be polite. Like, are you going to tell me if I have lettuce in my teeth or not? I need to know what type of friend you are. Are you going to tell me, or are you going to just look at me with the lettuce on my teeth and not tell me? I need to know what friend you are. Um, we'll, we'll tell someone if something's wrong, does not pick up on nonverbal cues, does not get why other people will not express themselves, and they prefer to communicate verbally. Whereas the nonverbal set, they send and bring messages through body language. How many of you are nonverbal? How many of you are verbal? When you get into the differences here, this is the problem. If you're assigning nonverbal meaning to nonverbal language and the other person's verbal, not even trying to express it that way, that's where a lot of miscommunication comes. So when you toggle this verbal versus nonverbal, you've got to go back to this model here and flip the meaning in. Hey, when you flipped that, like, for example, in Chile, where my husband served a mission, if you throw a pen or something at them, it's like the rudest thing you could ever do. Like it's very offensive to throw things at people. And we throw things at people here all the time. Like, hey, like I'm on the top of the banister, tell my kid, hey, catch this. You know, like you need something here, let me throw it over to you. Right? So that's nonverbal communication that was assigned a meaning. One thing I also had to learn about Julian. Um, is they point with their lips. They do. So yeah, exactly. So if you ask them where something is, that's what they do. And they say sipo. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, but everything has a po at the end. Sipo, yeah, you know, yes po, no po. Yeah. So um, so there's all of these. The cultural differences is a different test I'm not talking about today, but it is on my website. It's it's the La Serena test. So there is another one that, that tests culture cues. But, um, but with the nonverbal, people will pretend things are fine through their verbal language, but their nonverbal language expresses it. So for men, I train, if you, just, just, if you want to generalize, if you want to keep a man happy, ifs, I-F-S. Intimacy, food, sleep. Like, it's kind of that simple. Do some activities, you're good. If you want to keep a woman happy, I did 
an informal, informal qualitative study, and I found a pattern. People usually say, women, I have no clue. Do you know what it is? So simple. It's the, I have those three things. Are you ready for it? Soft touch. It's non-sexual. Touching hand, type of holding hands, you know, kind words, which I break it into two. I said, I'm going to go ahead and break it in. He's like, yeah, help everybody. Break it down to two. So it's appreciation and compliments. Soft touch, kind words. Soft touch, kind words. If, and to be food, so if we could just meet those basic five needs, a lot of things would be cured from my perspective. The tough skin person, they do not take things personally. They love to debate. They forgive easily. They're easy on themselves. They learn from their mistakes. They just don't care what other people think. The sensitive people, they take things personally. They interpret that, hey, the problem must be about me. What did I do? Did I do this wrong or right? Conflict is stressful in a fight, and so they process things slowly. And so if there's a sensitivity inside the marriage, it's hard to solve problems, right? You can't bring anything up. So you've got to build bridges on all of these ways. The box thinker is somebody who can categorizes their life into different boxes. And uh, they don't have to tell. And that's why your husband goes to work. He's a box thinker, too. He goes to work, he doesn't share, because when he gets home, he's not in his work box. And especially when there's problems at work, he doesn't want to. He can actually totally separate those. And I believe if you're going to be a, a good therapist, you have to get a box. And same with an attorney. I work with people with sexual abuse and horrible things, and you can't bring that home with you. You've got to learn to box it some way, or it's the wrong profession for you. Working with people in conflict like we do, you have to learn to box. And I wasn't boxed. I was spiral. Look at me right here. Um, life is a connected one. You carry all the worries. You, When others don't tell about their life as a whole, you feel like they don't want a close re relationship. A bad day at work equals a bad day at home because you have that overspill. And then finally, the assertive versus the pleaser. An assertive person likes to solve conflict as soon as it arises. They're conflict engagers. You, they do not worry about the conflict after it's resolved. They easily express their views. They like to get their way, and they keep score. Where the pleaser, they like to avoid conflict. They like to be validated. They worry about conflict even after it's resolved. They have a hard time expressing ideas unless they're very mad which is a problem, right? So we're only accessing problems when they're on their conflict track. You see back to what I was talking about before. They feel cheated if they don't get their way even though they haven't expressed it. And they'll say sorry twice. So when we talk about these differences that come through, if you're dealing with someone that is a pleaser, it's better to teach the couples to have a dual session. Here's why. So they, they, you go through and you resolve a conflict, the couple does. But when they leave, the pleaser is thought processing after the fact and saying, hey, what's going on? Like, oh, he said this and I should have said this. And, uh, because they have to think about things before they know. So when they have to develop things on the spot through a verbal process, it's very difficult for them. And so because of that, I tell my couples that you'll have one set to just do preliminary, and then you do a follow-up after they have had time to think about it. And then they do a second session, and then they have to be done with it or it creates marital garbage. But I hope that you guys realize that if people can be educated on the way they communicate and resolve conflicts, the way they negotiate, and the way they have action plans, if they can do that, if they can build systems for our future. So when you do these bridges, it's just like we've talked about. Look, you are um, a box and you are a spiral. So you realize, because you've done the test, you know that that's their matching cue. So then we build a system, which is in the future, if we have a problem, what are we gonna do about it? So we're gonna solve a future problem that hasn't even occurred yet. We're gonna solve future problems, then you say, Tamara, how can you do that? It's easy. If you analyze their past problems, you will find things to their disagreement. So then you take those things and you dissolve and you make it into resolving their future problems. So hey, you're boxed, you're spiral. 
When you come home, share something about your day. That's important for the spiral to go. Oh, I didn't know it. Your logic, your emotion. Look, you need to bullet. You need to say first sentence first. Oh, look, you need to repeat the feeling words so that they can feel heard and understood. You build these systems, and then they don't have conflict anymore. And so I tell people if the same issue has come up and has the same theme three times or more, you sit down and you build a system. You sit down and you think about how can we how can we resolve it. This both of these books actually have worksheets for them to build system. It gives five and six different techniques of what the common way are to solve things: the his her system, the compromise system, the one way system. But as you help people develop these action plans for the future, that can really help their marriage and their, their families to succeed. So we have three minutes for questions. So does anybody have a question that they, a burning question they would like to ask? This PowerPoint, is it accessible in there? I will put this PowerPoint on mindfulmarriage.love. It will be called the BYU Mediation Seminar. I will um, make a code. Sorry, let me write this code down. I will make the code of um, Go Cougars with no space and no capitals. So lowercase P-O-C-O-U-G-A-R-S. Does that work for everybody? I will put that up on Mindful Marriage tomorrow afternoon sometime because my, my, program, my programmer won't be there this afternoon. So, um, so yes, and I hope that that will be helpful for you. Any other questions? I have three more minutes. I wanted to leave a little time for questions. But maybe you guys will have them. So I'm really curious. What if you're really, really in the middle of a listener and talker? Mm -hmm. That's right. Like, it means you can divide both ways. Yeah. So more you're in the middle, this test is an abbreviated test. The real test online does five questions, so you can get more of a, you can, the gap gets filled a little bit more, but I don't use the long one for presentations. It, it takes too much time. But if you're in the middle, that's great news. It means you can attach both directions. But like, like an ambivert, for example, you have to, know which direction you're you're attaching to and doing it at the right time. No, I am an emperor and I was sitting there going like, I, I go with both of these and if my friend's a talker, I listen and if I try to listen or I talk. Exactly. So that's great. It means you're probably mid-spectrum on your communication style too. And John Gottman's research shows that those styles get along with, you get along with more people than other people that are on the extreme edges. Gotcha. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you talk about like, the relationship center individuals, how there's a, it's like venting, and you said there's just been venting and complaining. Yes. I, I've heard in like, previous classes, like, it can be negative to, like, just vent, but it also sounds like it's a good thing for relationships. It is. I'm wondering if you could, like, I don't know, I'm kind of confused about that. Okay, great. I so, for the most part, um, venting is where, just think of venting as like telling your best friend a conflict story and her being like, oh, you poor dear. That, like that's the venting process. And so what I, when this is an issue between couples, I just use language. Like if you're venting, I want you to say I'm venting. Because what that means is you just need to, you just need to listen to me and that's it. And I just got a video from a couple in Arizona so in January, when I did the Mindful Marriage Seminar in Arizona, and they sent me a video, and they're like, Tamara, your course has changed our lives. Because they talked about this thing where she would come home and want to vent about her day, because she works and he works. And he'd be like, your job was bad, well, my job was bad. you know. And then he would start into his process, which is less spectrum, whereas when you vent, you just want to be heard. And, and, and so they did this little demo for me, and like, and he was at the end saying, oh, okay, I'm going to use my three sentences. Oh, well, wow, man, your job is hard. And this, that, and the other. At the end, he touches her arm. Tamara, here's my soft touch that follows it up, you know. But bottom line is, if you have a language to communicate it, that makes a difference. And I want you guys to know as professionals that we hook together. All of us are working with high conflict people and high conflict situation and conflict resolution. Therapy isn't going to work for everybody. 
Mural mediation isn't going to work for everybody. Online education isn't going to work for everybody. Live seminars isn't going to work for everybody. Books aren't going to work for everybody. Right? So bottom line is, my thought is, as we share resources as a community, our people are better off because not one of us is going to be able to serve the all of us. And so as we work together and collaborate and really are able to focus on what's best for families, because I think that I haven't met a therapist who isn't committed to good families. And it really is the building block of society. And I know that it's such important work that you do, and I'm so appreciative of all the people I don't have to see as a divorce attorney because of your good work. So thank you guys for having me, and I'll stay after the class.